Good morning, everybody. We'd like to call to order uh, the special meeting of the Board of Supervisors for April 9th, 2018. If we could have a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. If you'll join us in a brief uh, moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good morning, Mr. Palacios. Uh, when, Chair, uh, friend, and members of the board, we do have one um, replacement page. This is on item 3E. There's a uh, new strikeout underline uh, version. Uh, nothing has changed in the actual ordinance, just other than the underline and strikeout did not show through in the original copy, so we've prov provided a replacement page. Thank you for that. So we'll move right on to the special meeting agenda. Item three is a public hearing to consider recommendations from the Planning Commission regarding proposed amendments to Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 7.128, 13.10, and 16.01, and related amendments to the General Plan Local Coastal Program for cannabis licensing and land use regulations for non-retail commercial cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, and distribution activities. Proposed amendments to County Code Chapter 13.10 are amendments to the Local Coastal Implementation Program as outlined in the memo of the Planning Director. We have the uh, various set of attachments, the letter of the Planning Commission, the proposed amendments and strikeout copies for 7.128, and the proposed amendments and strikeout underlying copies for 13.10 and the notice of the public hearing. We'll now open it up to staff for a presentation. Good morning, Ms. Bolster Grant. Good morning. Robin Bolster Grant, Cannabis Licensing Manager. On March 14th, 2018, the Planning Commission made 19 separate recommendations regarding the proposed regulations for the non retail commercial cannabis program. The Commission's actions built upon the direction provided by your board to uphold the community's shared values of environmental protection and neighborhood preservation while creating a blueprint for a successful regulated local commercial cannabis industry. A healthy local industry allows reasonable access to medicinal and adult use cannabis with appropriate safeguards against diversion to children and or the black market and other negative impacts to our quality of life. We feel the Planning Commission recommendations support the policy goals articulated by your board and meet the majority of the concerns voiced by the public. One area of concern that has been discussed is the tension between commercial cannabis activities and the expectation that folks have in residentially zoned neighborhoods. Several of the Commission's motions address this issue by restricting these activities to parcels that have been under cannabis cultivation for several years, eliminating the potential for new development to be approved in residential neighborhoods. Uh, timber production zone protections were also reaffirmed to similarly prohibit new development reducing the potential harm to sensitive habitats and forest land. We are seeking clarification regarding the date that we should use in order to define cannabis cultivation as existing. We've provided two options, dictating either that cultivation be established prior to January 2013 or November 2016, which was the close of our registration period. Recommendations were also made to enhance the incentives for developing our commercial agriculture zone property with commercial cannabis activity by expanding the number of properties that can take advantage of larger canopy restrictions and including owners of CA land to the category of eligibility for cultivation regardless of their own history of farming the land. One of the more problematic areas of concern has been odor. As requested by the Commission, staff extensively researched methods and strategies employed by other jurisdictions. And while there are a number of effective controls that can be applied to indoor cannabis operations, odor from outdoor cultivation remains extremely difficult to mitigate. In our judgment, the recommendations offered by the Planning Commission requiring written concurrence from neighboring property owners would not be an effective mitigation measure. We have offered two alternative approaches potentially increasing setbacks to neighboring habitable structures or restricting outdoor grows on smaller parcels. In addition, the Cannabis Licensing Office staff have observed measures such as planting lavender uh, or other scented vegetation as an odor buffer. It should be noted 
that the proposed recommendations limiting new development in residential neighborhoods mean that impacts associated with cannabis cultivation, including odor, have likely existed on these properties for several years. It is also our intention, as articulated in the enforcement plan, to track and report back on all commercial cannabis-related complaints. If specific sites are associated with a disproportionate number of odor complaints, the licensing office retains the discretion to withhold license renewal or imposed enhanced license conditions. As you are aware, the Planning Commission also introduced a new cottage license type to address the concerns of smaller established cannabis farmers. The restrictions attached to this license type were designed to help ensure that only existing established growers will qualify and unlike other license types, the property owner is required to live on site. While there may be some potential concerns regarding enforcement issues for these smaller parcels where odor may be more difficult to mitigate, we do recognize that this license type may serve the needs of small farmers that might otherwise be left out of the legal regulated environment. The Commission also asked staff to consider the issue of nurseries to respond to the needs of cultivators. In our opinion, the existing draft ordinance and proposal to reduce the minimum uh, commercial ag parcel size in order to qualify for greater canopy limits provides adequate opportunities for those cultivators seeking to establish cannabis nurseries without additional ordinance revisions. As we've said many times, the process of creating a brand new licensing program is by definition iterative and to some extent a work in progress. We expect to come back over time with refinements as we learn from our experiences. Staff is available to answer questions or discuss our research into any of these issues further. And we seek your policy direction at this meeting so that we can return with the draft ordinance for a first reading at your April 24th meeting. Thanks very much, that's all I have. Thank you, are there any brief questions from board members before we open up this public hearing? It'll obviously come back for deliberation from the board. So what we're going to do is we're going to open the public hearing just to give you sort of a brief overview of what uh, we'll be doing today. We're not gonna be adopting any ordinances today. This is an opportunity for you to provide uh, input into what has been a pretty extensive uh, process for us, is, but hopefully we're coming toward the end of, of that process. We have received all of your letters. We have received all the coalition letters, so just to keep that in mind before you give uh, your testimony today that it's something that we have seen. And we will take a break at uh, 1045 and again at noon uh, if needed depending upon how long today's meeting goes. So please do line up. We will uh, we'll afford two minutes uh, for every speaker and we'll open now the public hearing. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, thank you. My name is Steve Homan. I lived in Bonnie Dune for 42 years and I have some background in environmental health. Um, I wanted to reiterate what I have said before which is there are two streams that serve Davenport that emanate in Bonnie Dune, and there are seven streams in the San Lorenzo Valley that emanate in Bonnie Dune, and two springs that serve the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, and there are three streams and one spring that serve the city of Santa Cruz that emanate in Bonnie Dune. Also, the water that goes down these streams towards the San Lorenzo River in the San Lorenzo Valley uh, that, that which is not diverted by the San Lorenzo Valley Water District joins the San Lorenzo River and it has the potential to be, to flow to the ocean or also to be diverted by the city of Santa Cruz. So all of Bonnie Dune is a huge watershed for much of the North County. Pretty much from north of Boulder Creek to Davenport and from Davenport to Santa Cruz to Live Oak, the water supply depends on the water that falls on Bonnie Dune from rainfall. Uh, it's, it's at least 50% of the supply of those areas. So I think it's really important to make sure that all of Bonnie Dune is protected from unlawful grows uh, and from clear cutting of, wood, of the forest and from rodenticides and fertilizers and things that can enter the streams. So while it's been proposed that there be the Coastal Commission plus one mile, I think that's an artificial construct because it doesn't include all the headwaters of all the streams that serve all the water systems. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hellman. Good morning, welcome. Feel free, if anybody else would like to address us during the public hearing, feel free to uh, line up if it's okay with you. Good morning, my name is Tom Hearn. I'm here representing the Rural Bonnie Noon Association. 
The RBDA supports having the board adopt all of the recommendations of the Planning Commission. We see this as a compromise, but we would we prefer stronger measures to protect the environment, especially in the area zone timber production and residential neighborhoods. However, the political reality is that these measures are the best we believe that can be achieved at this point. Even if all of these measures are adopted, Santa Cruz County will still have the least restrictive commercial cannabis regulations in the state and probably in the country. A point I feel that needs to be emphasized is the enforcement of these regulations. Without rigorous enforcement, this regulatory experiment will is doomed to fail. Given that the estimate by Pan County planning staff puts the number of folks that are willing to submit to abiding by the regulations to grow cannabis legally is less than 10 percent, the total number of growers in the county of the total number of growers in the county, the legal growers won't stand a chance to survive, never mind thrive, if the illegal trade isn't curbed. And the rest of the community will continue to see the environmental de degradation and horrible wildfires that have already been the result of illegal cannabis trade. Again, we support mm -hmm. the adoption of the Planning Commission recommendations in whole. I'd like to thank the Planning, or the Board of Supervisors for taking the time to listen to the community and in considering our concerns, this is one of the most important land use regulations that this county will be facing in many years. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Eric Hoffman, Coalition for Environmental Santa Cruz. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of the supervisors um, for appointing the wonderful uh, planning commissioners. Um, we basically, as a group, um, are pleased with the outcome and the 19 motions they made that went on to you. As for the planning department, we feel they got it right on most of the motions, most of the information they uh, brought forth to implement the plan. Though on the uh, the odor issue, I th we think you missed the mark. We think that there are ways to measure odor that are scientific, and you can uh, use to make judgments that are both clear to cannabis growers and to people living near them. And there's other ways to mitigate. We've been saying this for about three years. Um, See, our focus now is sort of moved to the legal system and the, uh, the, pro the, the fact that only 760 people have um, gone forward with this program despite a lot of work that's gone into it. And so our concern is how are we going to deal with the non-growers who will still be operating outside of the system. And we don't see any budgetary things on that, so that concerns us quite a bit. Uh, we think that there should be record keeping uh, on par with what goes on in Santa Clara County. We've looked at different counties and what they've done uh, with their cannabis programs and we think there are examples that are um, clear for getting people information about what types of things are going on, how many incidences, and we think that there sh should be um, public recording, uh, that this should happen on maybe biannual basis. Uh, See, L lastly, rodenticides. Um, we know the state has outlawed rodenticides, but we really don't think that addresses the problem. Even the Planning Commission suggested that we do one, one inspection in a three-year period. That won't be sufficient to take care of the rodenticide problem. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Strickland, another gray beard from Bonnie Dune. Um, and said in aerospace, listen to the gray beards. But uh, I sat through the planning commission meeting the other day, or God, the marathon meeting, and I listened to the planning commissioners who had very strong opinions in generally the areas of protecting neighborhoods from land use change and protecting timberland. They came up with the 19 uh, options, for lack of a better word. They were pretty much unanimous on all of them. The extent, the, the, the nay votes generally were in the, realm of the didn't feel that the recommendation of the commissioners was strong enough to protect neighborhoods in timberland and there was a couple of no votes. I then looked at what came back from the planning's, planning department staff and I felt like they were walking back on what the commissioners had spent the entire day talking about. So I urge you to look carefully at the what the commissioners requesting and then look at what the planning the staff wrote, and there's some back-offs, like a level five became a level four review. Um, a reference to the um, um, 
Enforcement, we've already got a form online. I've tried to do a dry run of looking at that form and you really cannot fill that form out for this cannabis thing. If you see a fence that's too tall, I can take a picture, I can tell you the address, and I can say, go look at that fence, it's too tall. I can't find the pot in the, in, around the area. Uh, I know that right now on Felton Empire grade, you can smell pot. It's not overwhelming, it's not really obnoxious, but it's there. The closest pub, private land I can find is at least a thousand feet away, and that's my yard. There's no pot there. I've been locked out of, had to keep my windows closed for a whole week because of a pot grow that was about a quarter mile away. And now you can't see that using Google Earth because it's in, in a warehouse. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for those comments. Good morning, welcome. Hi, I'm, I'm Walt Haynes from Corlitas. Um, the big problem I'm having with the changes that the staff is recommending now is from 2013 to 2016. The, the reason for the 2013 was, a, was because of the green rush, because the county opened their arms to cannabis. So if you change it to 2016, all of these out of state and out of county people who have come around, especially in our area, bought up the land, are now eligible. And this whole 2013, 2016 was to, to stop this green rush. And so I really have a problem with changing that. Um, and also the TP zoning, I see, you know, I still have a problem with the TP zoning having any of this in there because this is what really affects us. And the, SUs are, the SU parcels and the TP parcels in the mountains are the same, <coughs> this, they have the forest, it's all the same kind of land and so SU is another, another problem. But this mainly, my issue is the 2013 to 2016, thanks. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Nancy Macy. I live in Boulder Creek, and I'm here for myself and my family as well as speaking as chair of the Valley Women's Club's Environmental Committee for the San Lorenzo Valley. We are very grateful for this public part process. We feel strongly that the planners and the planning commission have worked hard to provide thoughtful recommendations for you to consider. Uh, we too agree with the gentleman who just spoke that 2013 is the year you should be choosing. And um, I wanted to point out that uh, there's still one major problem, and that is the language of no duty to enforce. That clause is patently absurd. It's still in there. We urge that you, as our supervisors, insist that it be removed and that the county actually embrace its duty to enforce its own laws and hence to plan how to effectively enforce the regulations so that the legal growers can be supported and the illegal growers can be removed. Um, right now under the cannabis licensing website under enforcement, it, there, all there is is a public complaint form. There's nothing else talking about it. So, um, because in the past we haven't always, the county hasn't always enforced these regulations to protect the environment, uh, too many variances, administrative variances. We, I'm not clear whether administrative variances would still be allowed and I think they should be forestalled. They inherently undermine the requirements. We thank you for considering the long-term and cumulative impacts on the environment in our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Melody Meyer. Um, I'm the president of Source Organic. It's, I'm a local non-cannabis business that supports common sense regulations. I'm here to advocate for a safe, environmentally responsible, social conscious, and economically sustainable cannabis trade in, in the county. Uh, I support the written comments presented by Green Trade Santa Cruz, and I wanna highlight a few of those. The county has taken some good steps to ensure that existing compliant operators avoid serious dis business disruption by allowing them to seek a temporary state licensing prior to the adoption of a final ordinance. Please expedite this process and move forward on the proposed ordinance as soon as possible. More delays in adopting an ordinance will have adverse effects, adverse consequences on the ability of local operators to seek and receive annual state licensing in a timely manner. I urge the board to provide direction to the county licensing manager to fast track local authorization 
to allow limited operations for existing eligible non-retail cannabis businesses as they begin the local and state licensing application process. Uh, California voters approved Prop 64, which was based on a comprehensive state regulatory framework. Having served on a CDFA um, advisory committee for 10 years, I watched this process unfold. I believe there are compelling reasons for the county to adopt state language and definitions specific to cannabis operations. Collaboration between state and local agencies will be significantly enhanced if everyone uses the same terms and defines them the same way. Uh, I have many friends who have cultivated cannabis over the years in small co scale cottage like settings, including a cottage style license type will help those producers transition and reduce overall unregulated activities. This help maintain, help, will help maintain a sustainable amount of economic activity that will support residents, businesses, and consumers. In summary, expedite the process and move forward on the pr proposed ordinances as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you. My name is Brenda Chadwick. Um, happy to have an opportunity to talk to you all again about um, advocating for smaller cottage license type here in the county. I um, missed by four minutes getting this packet <laughs> included uh, today, so I'll uh, hand that over when I'm finished with my comment. Um, I did, in the packet, I have your original um, chair friend and supervisor Leopold, your uh, letter, uh, creating the Cannabis Cultivation Choices Committee, and that's when I first got started and involved in all this, the C4 Committee. And that was um, a real necessary uh, step. Um, so many people in the county had let it be known that a total ban the ban was not a good way to go, and I'm, I'm glad that you did that. I have a few other things, letters, um, you know, talking about home occupation, the pa Sentinel's first article that re the registration started, uh, then things started to get a little wonky because during that registration process, um, many things were changed. The fee went from $3,500 down to $500. The Type 1C specialty cottage license was became law in the state. And I came a number of times to encourage you to extend the registration, get the information out to people because I didn't really think that it had been. Um, I have my comments to the draft EIR, uh, talking again about cottage licensing and inclusion. Um, and I also have um, a tiered level for that, uh, that license type. So I am a member of the Green Trade Board and I, um, totally support their position paper on it, and Thank I you. encourage you to take a look at my packet. Thank you. Hi, uh, Pat Malo, um, Director of Green Trade. I also had the pleasure of serving on the C4 committee and being involved in all the fun that we've had for the last few years. Um, so we've got some really positive things that I think are on the table. Um, first, the cottage license. I think that we've been talking about that, talking about that, and we finally got the first step towards that. And so I really want to, um, you know, applaud everybody who's been working on that. I'd really like to um, compliment the planning commissioners for recognizing that, um, the, uh, some community groups, community prevention partners for recognizing that, and a lot of the board and their staffers for recognizing that. So I hope we can go forward. It doesn't completely fix the problem of all the small folks, but it starts to recognize their existence, and so thank you for that. Um, others have talked about um, our green trades, um, you know, need to extend this temporary licensing process to everyone who's attempting to get into this and is in good standing because um, we're getting to spring planting season right now and we want to be able to let as many folks into this as we possibly can so that these this conversation that we're having in the room today about what are we going to do about the folks who just don't want to follow the rules well first we need to divide 
the, figure out who those folks really are, and we need to get as many folks self-regulating as we possibly can to keep the group that is outside of regulations as small as it can be and as manageable as can be so that we can address all the neighborhood concerns, environmental concerns, community concerns that the cannabis industry shares. Um, you know, the last thing, there's a couple of pieces of the Planning Commissioner's recommendations that are not going to work. One of them is the idea about having to get permission from all your neighbors and pr as proof that it doesn't smell. I think that there is technology out there and we don't want to have that turn into some sort of extortion clause. Um, also the special use stuff needs to get fixed as long as the as well as the timber production. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning supervisors. I'm Bob Berlage representing Big Creek Lumber Company. You folks have a difficult challenge. Uh, your decisions are going to impact this county for the foreseeable future, so it's a tough job. Uh, we've submitted numerous documents o over the past couple of years. A recommendation is to not allow on timber production zones. Timber productions was created by the Timberland Taxation Reform Act in 1976, specifically to create a zone where the first best use and the primary use of growing and harvesting of timber. <coughs> That act also severely limited what else could be done on TP parcels and w with a little bit of leeway for counties, but I'm certain the legislature never intended for you to authorize an economic activity on TP lands that would supersede the growing and harvesting of timber. Uh, we agree with the comments that were submitted to you by the um, Santa Cruz County Farm Bureau, and in uh, Ms. Walker's letter, she pointed out a number of other counties that have forest lands that have made a decision to not allow uh, cultivation on TP for reasons that your board understands. It's the most difficult area to monitor and enforce, and it's absolutely the area where the likelihood of environmental harm uh, is likely to occur. I'm happy to answer any questions, and, and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Balaj. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, thank you for having the meeting today. I'm just gonna jump right in and address the um, blanket policy of requiring a level five permit for all properties except CA zone. Um, that will inadvertently create a bottleneck in the licensing system and prevent the licensing manager and staff from um, effectively approving permits in a timely manner. For example, there are properties that clearly should not require a level five permit. When the planning recommended that CA properties be uh, addressed the same as A properties. So you have an indoor cultivation CA property, no limit on size, uh, level three. But then you have a warehouse that up to 2,000 square feet, level five. It just clearly doesn't make sense um, when addressing warehouses, it should be streamlined. Current law would just be a change of use permit on warehouses. So minimum, I think, you know, level three, no limit on size. As well as CA properties outdoor would be a level four, yet A properties would be a level five. It just seems arbitrary to just do a blanket policy. These smaller cottage licenses will have a huge barrier of entry on cost, time. It, it just doesn't make sense to wipe out everything and make one thing. I think we should take a closer look at what the planning had recommended and make something that clearly makes more sense and is reasonable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Richard Bartel. I live in the Aptos Hills. I have two comments. The first is I've attended a lot of these meetings. I attended the Planning Commission meeting. I hear a lot of people talk about the problems that they're having with commercial cannabis grows in their residential environments. I myself have not heard anybody come in and talk about why it's important to allow this to continue. We've got a lot of area in this county where these grows could happen. The space is there. Why put it in a residential environment? The second is an experience I have, and I'm curious whether 
any commercial grow is going to see the same experience. Several years ago, my wife and I decided to build an ADU on our property. One of the requirements that came back from the planning department was, well, what color are you going to paint this? We need to make sure that this is compatible with the neighborhood that you're living in. How many people are gonna be concerned about the color of a hoop house that's gonna be in the property next to me? I don't think white is very compatible. If you wanna verify it, go on to Google Earth, look at this county. I don't think you can see too many houses. You can see a lot of hoop houses, little white rectangles. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning, Kevin Collins. Uh, I really appreciated the effort that the Planning Commission put into their recommendations to the board. They were very thoughtful. I generally support all of them. Uh, other than the, a couple of changes made by the uh, department at, subsequently, I think that the cottage grows still should have a level five review. This is merely the zoning administrator. It's not a full planning commission review. We, residents deserve this. I was, uh, when I read the EIR some months ago, I was shocked by the fact that uh, water resources were virtually unaddressed. Water pollution was not addressed. Water demand was not addressed. This is something that needs to be really understood. Uh, this is being eliminated from all the urban areas of the county, including the Highway 9 corridor, Soquel, et cetera, et cetera. But the water resource impacts are going to be serious if this expands to the level that it's anticipated. Uh, it, this uh, issue is also going to require a, a level of code enforcement that this county has never demonstrated. This is a new kind of development. It's not the same thing as whether or not someone puts an addition on their house. It's a f transformational land use decision. It's going to require, when you send an inspector out on a non-compliant site out in the middle of you know, the, the high end of the San Lorenzo or the SoCal watershed, they're gonna need a, an escort from the Sheriff's Department. This is gonna be quite expensive. We've got 750 people that are registered in some way. We've got thousands of people unregistered. Unless those, that situation is brought into compliance with these regulations, then this, uh, sh this uh, uh, square dance we've been having here in this room is not really going to mean very much. So you're going to have to prepare for actual code enforcement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm Phyllis Strickland, um, Bonnie Doon resident um, for decades. Um, I was um, uh, pleased um, to see the recommendations that the Planning Commission came back for and I felt really heard as a um, RA, um, a residential agricultural um, uh, community member. Um, and I was, um, I just want to point out that um, the Planning Commission was unanimous in terms of wanting to protect residential neighborhoods from especially manufacturing above a level one. Um, the only dissent was that they didn't want um, any manufacturing at all, one, uh, one member of the commission in RA. And um, I just would really like you to um, pay attention to their recommendations and the strength of those recommendations in protecting residents in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Jamie Padilla and I'm with United Farm Workers and we're here supporting uh, the development of a socially responsible and sustainable cannabis industry in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz County is a really special place for our organization. We have members throughout the county and, uh, and, and we have a special relationship with a farmer uh, here uh, it's with Swantonberry Farms. We represent those workers and, uh, and, and have a collaborative and productive relationship with, with the farmer where uh, everyone benefits. And we look forward to developing those types of partnerships with cannabis producers as well. And uh, we are collaborating with folks from Green Trade and just want to be here and, and support the, uh, the adoption of, of an ordinance in Santa Cruz. Thank you. 
Morning. Good morning, my name is Christopher Carr. I am here on behalf of local compliant farmers and also I am a board member with Green Trade and Green Trade is Santa Cruz's largest coalition of cannabis businesses and supporters. I just wanted to commend the work of the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors. This is an ongoing process, and I also wanted to extend a cordial invitation. I uh, submitted my public comment via email, but I am currently a cannabis uh, environmental steward, um, outdoor, specialty outdoor on TPZ zone land, and I think I would cordially invite my uh, comrades here from Big Creek Lumber and, and the board to potentially either submit photos and demonstrate there are, some of these parcels are 40, 90 plus acres. So there's adequate space to facilitate uh, a wholesome, environmentally friendly timber harvest, and there are also open spaces to facilitate specialty uh, regenerative outdoor cultivation. So I think there's there's room here for all of us to coexist and to partner, and if we don't act fast and ensure an, an administrative process that provides the safe harbor for all our local operators in good standing, we're gonna lose a lot of these local businesses to Monterey County, Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, uh, because those counties are up and running. So I just want to be solution driven and provide a, uh, an olive branch and cordially invite anyone interested, I submitted an email, so you have my email, and anyone else, um, I have business cards, so thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Mark Real, Larkin Valley, and you may remember that I live in the floor of Larkin, the floor of Larkin Valley, and there are two continuous A-zone parcels that are surrounded by RA, or like parcels, within this coastal zone one mile designation. Although a grower began cultivation after 113, who should be disqualified from li li further licensing under this ordinance, my concern is that should these properties be sold, a grower that could be licensed or is licensed would move in, grow and under their license without consideration of the neighbor's concerns. Thus licensing should be considered by the lot not the and the neighbor's concern, regardless of the lot's designation and not just the grower's suitability. Pre preliminary notice and due process for the neighborhood to contest a potential licensing should be under this ordinance under these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Hi, good morning. My, na <clears throat> My name's Kathy Toner. I'm also grateful for all the um, public input and all the hard work, and I also want to commend the Planning Commission and all their input. I would like to um, also urge and support the adoption of their recommendations with a few um, suggestions. Uh, even with the adoption of those recommendations, we would still be looking at having the most permissive um, regulatory framework in Santa Cruz County, as was mentioned in the state, um, and possibly beyond. So. I think that we've gone a, a long way towards accommodating the uh, interests and making some serious concessions. And so I'm here to say that I think enough is enough. We should move forward with this and not allow further weakening of this, um, of the proposed ordinance. I would include, I would endorse the comments that were made to keep the level five review for the cottage um, uh, license. It is only fair. Uh, a couple of concerns, though, that remain. Uh, the issue of enforcement has been raised, and I, I really think, unless I've missed it, I don't see the enforcement plan before us. I don't understand how we can consider and adopt, how you can adopt an ordinance with all the issues that have been raised without knowing what that enforcement plan is going to look like. So, unless I'm missing it, I would say no, no enforcement plan, no ordinance. I, I would say that needs to be in place and we need to have a chance to look at that for all the issues that have been raised. <coughs> um, and that includes being fair to those who wanna participate in, the, in regulation. We need to really know how we're gonna create an e equal playing field for them through serious enforcement. So no plan, no ordinance. Um, Robin mentioned up front, and I think it's very true, this is gonna be a learning process, and uh, we've seen the law of unintended consequences from policy decisions in the past. So I would recommend a serious monitoring and evaluation mechanism be added to this, some sort of annual report, as was mentioned, as being done in Santa Clara County. Some public hearing. I think every year we should know how we're doing on some of these important indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. 
Good morning, Supervisors. Mary Jo Walker. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to very conscientiously and thoughtfully deliberate the subject. I appreciate it personally. I'm going to reiterate, reiterate some of the comments I've made in the past because they're important to me. Please protect our uh, rural communities. This is a goal that your board stated time and again, and allowing commercial grows, large commercial grows in RA and SU does not protect our neighborhoods. Uh, other similar counties do not allow this. Also, preserve our timber production zones. This is where our water comes from, this is where much of our wildlife lives, and this is where uh, it is most difficult to enforce. Do not allow class two or class three manufacturing in our ATP or SU zones. These are commercial operations and they can be uh, dangerous. Um, I'm still unclear as to how the licensing officer is going to track cumulative environmental impacts, which as you know is required. For example, the cumulative water use of a particular, in a particular water district. I don't understand how that's going to be done. Please eliminate the no duty to enforce clause. County Council apparently agrees that it serves no legal purpose and it sends the wrong message. As a matter of fact, I think you should be saying the county does have a duty to enforce. Uh, reporting back to the board is essential for transparency. Uh, you and we citizens should receive information regularly about the number of enforcement activities uh, started and completed, the number of licensing licenses granted and denied, etc. cetera. Uh, protect the coastal zone plus one mile. Please stop modeling our ordinances after Humboldt and Mendocino County. Uh, we are not like those counties. Within the past couple of years, a number of more similar counties have passed ordinances that we should be looking at. Odor is still a problem. We've talked about that already. I support the Planning Commission's recommendations by and large. And finally, enforcement is key. The county has not done a good job with enforcement in the past. Uh, this is obvious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, Board of Supervisors, for all the time and energy. Um, there we go. Uh, for putting into the issue of the cannabis cultivation. Um, it's been a long road, long journey. I think I um, also want to say thanks to staff and um, just that uh, we've done, I think, a pretty good job. I think there's some room for some improvements. Um, partic particularly, I want to bring up the level five and um, coming up with a little data on the level five. Um, I believe right now the current, current uh, county offers four appointments per week for discretionary applications, the level five. Um, if we were to take half the cannabis applications and say that they were to come in for processing um, that would be scrutinized up to, we you know, figure around 300, it could take anywhere from 60 to 75 weeks um, just to get an appointment. And that assumes no one else outside of the cannabis industry wants an appointment in Santa Cruz. So the level five does present a certain difficulty in sticking with where we need to be on a state level to be compliant. Um, also, um, the, the, the odor stuff coming up and we do support um, scrubbers in, in indoor operations and whenever we can deal with the smell of cannabis, but ultimately um, neighbors having the ability to control what you do on your property as far as your business goes. Um, talking to the Act Commissioner and, and other staff, there's no other industry where that's enforced or there's a veto power for neighbors to build a veto your application and license process. So we get into this um, potential conflict with um, a neighbor and they could literally come and shut your operation down because you didn't pay enough road dues or they didn't pay what you wanted to. So we just want to avoid any extortion type of scenarios that could come up with um, regards to that. Um, the last kind of issue is the legal non-conforming stuff. Thank and you. in some of the um, M zones, we just wanted to have some consideration potentially, discretion Thank for the licensing official. Thank you. Good morning. Hi everybody. Um, my name's Pete Rich and I've been a contractor in the San Lorenzo Valley since 82. Uh, I first became aware of the situ of, of uh, the process and when I was in college in uh, Mount San Antonio College, I took a political science class. After that, I served in the armed forces to defend my country, so I've learned about the process. I fought to defend the process and I'd like to thank all of you guys 
And I'd like to thank all the people here, the people that agree, Sir, if you the could people use the that disagree, because we're all coming together as a community. So I'm gonna use my time right now as it's rapidly going away to speak for the unspoken. There's a lot of kids that have been disenfranchised. There are a lot of kids that are countercultural. There are a lot of kids struggling with mental issues and with drug issues. And I've seen the cannabis industry take these kids in and I've seen their lives transformed. I've seen them learn a work ethic, learn a job skill, and I've seen them be able to uh, uh, so have social mobility. They live in houses now, not in cars and tents. So I'm very aware of that. I've also seen the influence of you guys and the guys that do and the guys that don't get along always. I've seen the industry clean itself up and self, nobody wants, we all love the mountains, we all love Santa Cruz, we all love each other. Let's pretend that that microphone's for you. Together. Sir, need to work together to sir, I need you to use the microphone. I need you to use the microphone. full of opportunity. Thank you, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Henry Clay would be proud. <laughs> Good morning, welcome. Good morning, uh, Rick Rose. Um, I wanna talk to something similar uh, to, what, uh, to what Pete was, was saying, and that's a special use the SU, um, uh, the SU zoning. Uh, currently, uh, the, uh, the SU zoning requires um, uh, agricultural quarry or heavy industry. Uh, I believe probably 90 to 95% of, uh, of small operations fall in this category. And uh, this would pretty much eliminate uh, their ability to function uh, as responsible cultivators and um, uh, it appears that uh, you know perhaps those kinds of restrictions would lead to uh, something akin to green lighting, um, black market type of things. And uh, I believe that it's one of one of the, the key elements in uh, coming up with this document is to uh, to avoid that kind of thing and to get people out of that area into into the light and to conform with uh, uh, what the requirements of the county are. Um, so, um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Kappos, welcome back. Thank you, good morning to you, and um, thank you all for uh, sitting through this process, helping this uh, process move along. Uh, I particularly appreciate the fact that you ha are holding a special meeting on this issue. It demonstrates the um, concern that you have, the, uh, the desire to hear from everybody. I think that um, no one can fault this board for not being inclusive and uh, deliberative in this process. I'd also like to uh, uh, express my appreciation to the county staff from the CAO's office, the county council, the planning department, and of course the cannabis licensing office uh, for doing a tremendous amount of work, uh, often uh, with mixed messages uh, directing them. So uh, I think everybody, uh, even op opponents of this plan, have been uh, thoughtful and conscientious in uh, their efforts to make this work. There are two particular issues I'd like to address uh, and I think are the most important things that you can do today. The first is to direct staff to include the cottage license type. This is really going to uh, be important to uh, get a handle on the uh, unregulated market, including uh, people in this very small uh, license type will go a long way to uh, relieving uh, the enforcement obligations uh, that will be, the, that will fall to the licensing office. The second deals with that, and that is to direct the staff to come up with an expedited process to deal with the, uh, what are going to be a, a, a very comprehensive and onerous application uh, process first with the Cannabis Licensing Office and then with the Planning Department. Thank you. Uh, Thank Mr. you. Coffis, Mr. Coffis, I had a question about your letter uh, regarding uh, special use, <coughs> excuse me, zoning. Uh, you were concerned that the 
<clears throat> excuse me, the uh, changes for SU parcels significantly reduces uh, the number of parcels eligible, and uh, you didn't go into more explanation, so I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about that. Well, the, the uh, eliminating, uh, what's the best way to put this? About 40% of eligible parcels uh, will be eliminated with if the restrictions on SU are, are adopted. Is, is that because of the acre size? Uh, no, it's because of the uh, underlying designation. And I'd, I'd like to remind everybody that, I mean, I, I've been 71 years a California resident and uh, I've seen agricultural, uh, the underlying uh, zoning for most of California was agriculture. I've seen that disappear in a lot of ways. I mean, the Santa Clara Valley uh, used to be pretty full of agricultural activities. Now the best crop is a condominium. And so uh, I, I you know, I'd like to see us uh, preserve small-scale agriculture of all types throughout the county. I mean, that is the trend, distributed all right. uh, hey, agriculture. Mr. Coppice, uh, this is a very specific question. It's not an opportunity to have an additional uh, commentary. So, uh, excuse me. So, Supervisor <laughs> Leifold, if we could narrow what that question specifically is and have the speaker specifically yeah, answer uh, that. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next um, speaker. I thought that the um, Planning Commission came up with a fairly elegant way of s acknowledging people who are uh, good stewards at their current zone parcels, but it would prevent it uh, in the future. And I'm wondering if the, their recommendations affect current growers or your concern is future ability for people to be able to grow on SU parcels. Well, today it affect, we're, we're concerned about the current growers. And so does the, the Planning uh, Commission's recommendation affect the cur current growers or is your concern have to do with those, uh, with those in the future? It has to do with the current growers. You know, the, the future, w uh, w we advocate for z no minimum parcel size and no zoning restrictions. Agricultural activities are permitted on every zone parcel in this county, and uh, cannabis should be no different. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. My name is Stephen Beals. I represent several stakeholders in Santa Cruz County. I would like to briefly speak on the 200 foot setback requirement. Requiring a 200 foot setback is a mistake. Allowing for a reduction of that to 100 feet is insufficient to correct that mistake. Some of the most suitable locations for cannabis operations in Santa Cruz County will be adversely impacted by this requirement. The setback should be eliminated for M zoning districts and other similar zoning districts completely. This is especially true in instances where you have legal non-conforming habitable dwellings in close proximity to intensive use zoning districts. And I think the 100 foot um, reduction is inadequate. So when you're looking at um, the setback requirements, I hope that you take that into consideration, allow staff some discretion to reduce the setbacks. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi. <coughs> Hi, my name is Isaiah. I've been a Santa Cruz resident my entire life. Um, yeah, so I do appreciate um, how we've progressed this ordinance and I appreciate everyone's work we've put into it. Um, I guess I want to echo what Steve was saying about, you know, we're trying to move into more industrial zoning for um, indoor cultivation and there are legal non-conforming structures within very close proximity to a lot of those sites that are very suitable for indoor cultivation. So in the spirit of trying to move in more of a commercial realm, you know, that kind of inhibits us to do that. And another, another point that was spoken earlier is that it seems for as many level five reviews that are gonna be necessary to um, accommodate everyone who's applying, it doesn't seem like Santa Cruz County has the um, capacity to deal with all of them and I don't think there's really a mechanism to really go through that many level five reviews in a time proximity that allows us to comply with state regulation and be able to get our state license and be in compliance. So those are two things for me that stand out. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. 
Good morning, everyone. Eric McCall, Blue Belly Consulting Group, Green Trade Board member, and a representative of folks trying to do right. There's one group that hasn't been represented yet, and I would like to read a comment from them. It's the legendary breeders who are ahead of cultivators. Without breeders, you don't have a food chain. We would like to recommend an addition to the nursery license called a heritage cannabis license to protect seeds, mother plants, and a trust for tax-free research, seed and strain preservation, and legacy breeding. We should be allowed up to 50% of a commercial cannabis because typically breeder operations are kept separate from commercial cannabis operations. You're in a phenome hunt, you're looking for information. You may have multiple generations being bred that are not destined for commercial sale you can track and trace them to state approved destruction, but then that portion, the seeds or the clones would be useful. So heritage cannabis is an essential element of a vibrant holistic future and the very bones and blood of a sustainable taxable cannabis industry. So we need policy that protects cultivars, cannabis plants from all over the planet, many with special medical effects, environmental adaptations, and some the result of multi-generational breeding work. These living libraries hold our regional heritage. Unique heirloom plants are our best hope for breeding new cultivars. We're known for being the best breeders on the planet. Some of our legendary cultivators who are breeders need more space and they need to be able to flower. It's not a taxable event because they're not selling this hunt. They're selling the cultivars and those, yes, tax those if you must, but we need to make room in our nursery provision for an heirloom or a heritage research project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, my, <clears throat> my name is Jim. I live in Felton. I actually live in Lompico. I live uh, on the southwest side of a slope, a little bit down from the top of the mountain. And one day in the summertime, I was out in my yard and I heard a plane fly over, you know, disappeared, you know, and I didn't pay any attention. A few minutes later, and then pretty soon it was, and of course, something's not right here. It's like the plane's right over my, do you, any of you live in the mountains? Do you live in the mountains? Do you live in the mountains? Do you live in the mountains? What about you, Mr. McPherson? Do you live in the mountains? Do you live in the mountains? Okay. So I'm up on this steep road, dead end road, okay? Private road off another private road in Lompico Canyon. I, I see that flash of white and red. So I get up on my roof and I look, and there it is. It's a CDF plane, a big one. But not just one, it's got a spotter plane with it, another CDF plane, two. And they're flying around my house. And I look, I go, oh my God, holy, yeah. That's flying around me, it's me. And all of a sudden, I get this fear, this primal fear. Oh my God, what am I gonna do? Should I run now? Should I grab the cat and put her in the box? And what do I take? And you know what? It turns out it was a, on the news they say, oh, it was a barn, it was an outhouse, it was a storage shed, it was a grow. It was less than a thousand feet away in Ziani, the third fire we'd had in a few years. One house burned totally to the ground, melted trailers, it was in the news, the guy that living in there, this tenant, uh, the, the grow watcher, another grow house, escaped with his guitar and his bare feet. Then another year later, the house next door has a, a, a honey oil fire, this, this is a dangerous business, and you're about to unleash a force that you can't control. And I just ask you to remember the Oakland Hills fire, and a lot of people died in their cars trying to Thank escape you, that fire on the roads. Thank you, sir, I appreciate it. Hi, my name's Dennis Farley, and I'm here to talk about when you're raising the time limit to 2016, I feel that anybody who bought property before it was voted legal has the right. They didn't vote or they didn't come here for the green rush. They were here before. And I just feel that they have the right as anybody else to, uh, to apply for a license and, uh, and to continue on doing it. If you don't allow them, most people will do it anyways. They'll do it. So I think it's better to have control and get the taxes and the money. And anyways, that's what I feel. Thank you. 
Good morning. Good Welcome morning. back. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Jenna Shankman. I'm with the uh, Coalition Community Prevention Partners. Um, foremost, I want to thank everyone um, for including so many different um, prevention elements through this um, public process and encourage the retention of them um, that limit access to youth and just kind of shape the norms in our community. Um, those include setbacks from sensitive areas, restrictions on advertising and products and packaging that have specific youth appeal, which we've talked about more at other meetings and just all the site security measures with locking of the product, odor mitigation and lack of visibility and um, diversion prevention um, for, for everyone it's not intended for, but specifically for young people. Um, but CPP also supports um, finding pathways for these existing small businesses that are being discussed um, if they um, meet certain conditions with the best management and operation plan and what the planning uh, commission laid out for the um, type Type seven cottage license, um, since this will allow uh, bringing these businesses into compliance and um, having regulation, looking having more environmental monitoring, and um, yes, we obviously support just kind of the ongoing uh, monitoring for this overall program and making corrections where necessary to ensure um, success for just the common values that keep coming up over and over again of environmental stewardship, neighborhood compatibility, um, and health and wellness. So thank you very much for your consideration on this important issue. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ann Kelson and I represent several stakeholders in Santa Cruz County in addition to serving as the legal advisor to the California Compassion Coalition. And I want to thank the uh, Board of Supervisors for their hard work and also for the staff as well. Um, just to kind of back up and provide an eagle's eye view of things, currently California has only 15 counties out of 58 that actually have ordinances in place. And to a certain extent, it is a state of emergency. Um, there are other organizations and there are bills in place right now trying to address market collapse, like doing away with the cultivation tax. But here at home, what we need to look at is the fact that we need to have an expedited administrative process to protect the people that already have letters of good standing who've made those efforts and have partnered with the county for several years and are known operators who are not, as far as we know, doing anything other than to diligently comply and to help assist in the creation of, of this regulatory scheme here in the county. Um, they are in limbo. We ha some of them have temporary state licenses that may expire. We don't know what will happen when that happens. Um, I'd also like to encourage the county to consistently look to the state for guidance in terms of adopting terms and other uniformity. Um, right now, the whole state is looking at a patchwork quilt and just looking at those numbers of 15 out of 58 counties just shows you that. Um, in three years' time, cannabis will be viewed the way tomatoes and grapes are. And we don't need to have cannabigotry or other preconceived fears and notions get in the way of looking at the fact that at least 40% of these letters of good standing could be eliminated altogether when they've been known farmers out operating and trying to do everything they can in order to bring their uh, business, legitimate businesses, above board. And with that, I just wanted to add with the nuisance clause right now, as it stands, it truly is an, an, um, an extortion clause. Typically, nuisances are things that we can measure. They're things that are based on reasonableness and the way that it's written right now. There really is no measure or reasonableness Thank you. other than, all right. Um, Thank you. And I wanted to say there are emergency regulations yeah. coming out for compassion Ma by the you. state, and it's this okay. county should be it's informed okay. of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just trying to get everybody in. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Wes Dewhurst. I'm a cultivator here in the county and the member of the Green Trade Organization. Um, I'm here today to talk about the definition of canopy in the current draft ordinance. Um, the stipulation that canopy can be non-contiguous but must be separated by walls is impractical due to the need to access our plants to work on them. Without walls separating non-contiguous canopy, the ordinance could be read to mean that the entire floor area of a greenhouse structure could be counted as canopy. This would effectively eliminate a large percentage of our already limited canopy because we need that space for aisles, walkways, equipment, and work areas. In most cases, these things would take up at least a third of our greenhouse floor space, so this definition would remove more than 30% of our available canopy. The fact that our vegetative plants are counted against canopy limits also introduces undue restrictions on production. Generally speaking, about 25% of any given cultivation canopy would be dedicated to propagation and vegetative growth. If this 25% is included in our canopy allowance, it would reduce our production by the same percentage. 
While the most recent draft ordinance allows stacking vegetative plants in multiple layers to ease this burden, this method is not feasible in greenhouses or outdoor production, putting us at a significant disadvantage. I'd like to use our ranch as a case study to illustrate this point. We're fortunate enough to have a CA parcel in South County which qualifies us for the maximum of 22,000 square feet. If we remove a third of that canopy for the space needed for ancillary activities, I'd be left with a little over 14,000 square feet of canopy. If I remove from that the 25% of canopy I need for propagation and vegetative plants, I'm left with just under 11,000 square feet of flowering canopy, less than half of my original canopy limit. For those that aren't aware, square footage of flowering canopy is the multiplier through which we establish our projected revenue. So when I have to calculate the potential revenue from our site, I'm using not the intended canopy limit of 22,000 square feet, but the effective flowering canopy of less than 11,000. This means our potential revenue and the potential tax revenue for the county would be cut in half. Um, simply adopting the state definition of canopy would fix both of those problems. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us in the public hearing? Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Okay. Please, please step forward. Kirk, if you want to address us, now's your chance. Morning. Hello, my name is Megan Richofsky. I'm a resident of District 5. And um, I'd like to address a little, some personal issues as well as um, kind of the terrorism around fires in the mountains and such. Um, of course, there's negligence in every facet of life and regulations placed by the county would hopefully uh, do away with any people who are not qualified or don't know what they're doing in the mountains and causing problems, right? Um, I also ask to address the special use um, parcel bar in the mountains. It's like you're hearing it's inhibiting up to 40% of people. Um, when you asked Mr. Coffa specifically about if it was acreage, that is also an issue for a lot of us. I know a lot of uh, people in our area are uh, afraid and, and angry about not being able to do what they've been doing for half their lives or more. You know, um, so thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the Board of Supervisors, Kirk Schmidt. I'm a uh, greenhouse owner in, on CA land in South County and also representing the, Cal the Santa Cruz Farm Bureau. Um, over this process so far, you've had many changes in the proposed regulation. There are many that have been very beneficial to CA land to open up more grow, more opportunities on CA land, particularly in existing greenhouses, and this would include reduced acreage limitations that was proposed by the Planning Commission, as well as a clarification of uh, including ownership as well as farming for three years as a criteria for obtaining a license on CA land. However, there, as other people have spoken today, there's a significant deviation between the state definition of canopy which is relatively simple and quite clear, um, but is set out in detail as to the difference between a flowering canopy and a non-flowering nursery crop. The provisions in the b ordinance before you would be totally different and would create confusion both in your enforcement the state's enforcement, and more particularly when you get to the issue of taxation, you would be taxing at one rate and the state would be taxing at another rate and it would be difficult for the growers to, d to distinguish between the two because of the entirely different definition. It would be easier for Santa Cruz County to adopt the state definition if you feel that the size limitations are too great, then change the size, but don't come up with a new definition. Lastly, the issue of existing greenhouses on CA land is somewhat confused here because in some parts of the ordinance they're called structures and other parts are called greenhouses. But structures require odor abatement and scrubbers and greenhouses, the large greenhouses in South County average over 100,000 square feet each and it's impossible to Thank have you. a scrubber. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schmidt, can I just ask you a question? Yes. Um, the, it's been suggested that the nursery uh, definition should also conform to the state definition. Do you have a point of view about that? I believe that if you adopted both the flowering definition and the nursery definition and the state definition, it would be much more clear for enforcement uh, and for taxation. The definition, the distinction between the two is whether it's flowering or not. 
Um, while I have talked to staff and they've cons been concerned about the ability to distinguish this as a farmer in a greenhouse that used to be full of roses, I can assure you it's easy to distinguish between a flowering plant and a non-flowering plant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, my name is Isaac and I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz County. And there was a couple topics I would like to discuss. Um, the first one being the level five for the zoning development. And I feel like that would just give the neighbor the power to veto your license and no other ag businesses are subject to this kind of scrutiny. And I truly believe it's an extortion clause. I think a level four would be more permissible where you have to post a sign on your road where neighbors have to drive by and are aware of the fact of what's going on. There are a few positive things that I would like, I liked in the ordinance and uh, one of them being the co-location um, aspect of it and uh, allowing uh, the nursery square footage to allow us for that. And uh, the last thing I would like to discuss is a more uniformed approach to the whole, the whole dynamic of this whole, uh, this whole thing going forward. So in basically the uh, commercial ag is being pushed ahead of everybody else because of less strict regulations. And so I would like, just like to see the, the RA and everybody else, the other types of zoning to get a more fair approach and get a level playing field with that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Is there anybody else beyond the speaker that would like to address us? Okay. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Sandeepan Balachandran. I registered for the um, uh, license back when it was available. I actually live in Boulder Creek. I live on a property which is zoned residential agricultural. And this is a, since, since people talked about the uh, cottage cannabis, this is a prime example of my situation because it is compliant within a lot of the setbacks, even your uh, 200 foot uh, pretty ridiculous setback of a uh, house on a neighboring parcel. It is compliant within that, but the only problem with this plot is that it is not five acres. And um, knowing the neighbors and where they are located, I've been, we've been living on this property for three years, that it is really unfortunate that a property like this, which is actually uh, complies to a lot of the regulations put forth, except for one, and would be unusable for cannabis or honestly any other type of agriculture because it's too small for wine or vegetables. So that's all I have to say, thanks. Thank you. Is there anybody else beyond the speaker that would like to address us during this public hearing? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Seth Smith. I live in uh, Capitola. Um, last week, uh, I'm sorry, I'm with Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance. We're one of the state licensed cannabis uh, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, retail operations here in Santa Cruz County and the city of Watsonville. Um, last week, we gave a tour of our facility in Santa Cruz County uh, to uh, our congressman, Jimmy Panetta, who uh, came through, walked around, looked at everything we were doing, talked with us a lot about what we were up to, um, the challenges we're facing, different advocacy efforts that we're involved in, uh, the effect of taxes on patients, all that kind of stuff. Um, it was a very good discussion. We would like to offer the opportunity, as I'm sure many of these folks uh, have and, and would also agree, would like to op offer the opportunity to any of the members of the Board of Supervisors to also come by to our facilities, either here in Santa Cruz County or in the city of Watsonville, so that we can show you kind of what this looks like on the ground, so that you have a better frame of reference for some of these issues that people are bringing up to you today. Um, that's a that sort of standing invitation for any of you. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Good morning, my name's Julie Thompson. I um, am a landowner in the mountains, and I'm here um, encouraging and advocating for SU lands to be allowed to apply for licenses like many of my other um, neighbors here. Th there are many people that have been growing for years that we all know very responsibly to the environment, to the water around them, um, and we should be allowed to now have legal licenses to continue our craft in the mountains. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, welcome. 
Good morning, my name is Glenn Astrove. Uh, I'm a property owner in Bonnie Dune, and I have been, my family has been for generations. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about my concerns about the level five review, the length of time that it's going to take to get through this. And my big concern is that the temporary licenses that are held now will run out. And the people put into positions of they have invested into this. My big concern is the black market growing. And when people do go towards the black market, these are the problems in Bonnie Dune I see with neighbors not respecting everything that goes in, in, in that we're fighting for. So I just wanted to say my concern is the time period, if we could push that forward and stomp out these black market opportunities. Thank you, I appreciate your time and I appreciate Thank you. everybody. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us? Okay, seeing none, we will close the public hearing. Uh, once you've spoken once, you can't speak again, but thank you. Um, and we'll bring it back to the board, and the board can have questions and comments, and we'll also have action. What I would recommend that the board do from an efficiency standpoint, there may be items uh, that are relatively non-controversial in this set of planning commission recommendations that I think we should just take in one motion. Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, I think then we can uh, move on the other items to uh, go in more depth on. So I'll start with uh, Supervisor, we'll just go down the line. We'll start with Supervisor Caput, if you'd please start us off. Okay. okay. So Any microphone might uh, need to be turned on. Uh, uh, a real simple question, I think, in the beginning. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is tax time. Uh, people are filing their taxes. And uh, people are going to have to put down their income and they're going to have to put down their expenses. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, federal tax, uh, they're going to have to put down taxes uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, income that comes from uh, marijuana. Uh, how, do, how does that look? How, how are they going to be able to talk to the IRS uh, when it comes to explaining uh, that the income that they're getting is uh, something that's uh, actually contrary to federal law? And we're not going to be able to help them explain that with the IRS. No, the short answer to that question is I don't know. We, we don't do tax, um, personal tax law for folks, and we don't, we don't um, uh, get involved with IRS regulations and what it is that they're going to have to declare to the IRS. That's up to each individual to do. You bet. Okay, but I, I guess r just a little bit farther on that. State law would trump, well, let me uh, rephrase that. State law would... Uh, override uh, county law <laughs> and federal law would override uh, uh, state law. It, it, that's in a preemption analysis that would make sense, but um, you know the, the, the county can can pass laws uh, where the state has or the feds have not um, taken the field, so to speak. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense, uh, except. Uh, you know, federal law kind of changes with each election, and that's why I rephrased the word uh, federal law trumps uh, <laughs> state law. <laughs> you see what I mean? Uh, so could that change in the future? We could have a shift one way or the other? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll try to make this brief, uh, but I'll go through a few items here. Uh, we're share, uh, share, we share the benefit and the burden uh, with everything. And everything that I've looked at in the uh, past, I try to make sure that District 4 gets its share of the benefit along with the burden. Uh, I've seen it happen with affordable housing. We've gotten our share and other parts of the uh, uh, county are also building it and uh, sharing the burden and, uh, and the benefit, of course, is affordable housing. Uh, then when we get uh, to road taxes, that's based on a allocation of road miles. Uh, more road miles in certain districts get more tax money, even though the tax money is paid by all the people of the county. Uh, the point I'm getting to is on this issue, of economic and environmental justice, um, I see a large burden on CA where most of this is going to be done is going to be in District 4. 
and I would like to see an allocation of uh, more money going for, to the district of the origin of most of the money that'll come from the uh, cannabis uh, production. But I don't see that in this. So if we, if we have a de facto ban in certain districts, uh, we can look at a map, uh, map number on page number 16, if you're able to put that up. Uh, you can see that almost all the uh, uh, commercial lag is in District 4. Okay, you bet. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, so uh, what I'm getting at is if we have different ways of uh, sharing tax money in certain areas getting more because of road miles or affordable housing and what, and what have you, I don't see any of that here. And certain districts will be benefiting uh, on the burden of uh, the people of District 4, which is a very low income uh, district. So nothing in the ordinances that are before your board addresses how tax revenue will be spent. Those are policy decisions that are up to your board to be made during budget time. Right, so that's the difference between verbal and actual written uh, interpretation at this point. I'm not following. And it's not. It's not in. It's not in writing. I mean, uh, how this is going to be allocated? Look at the green area, and you see it's all in District Four. I, I don't see any in much in the other districts. When you when you count the coastal uh, land and also the one mile setback, and so I'm, I'm getting at the burden here. And just as a point of clarification. It, it doesn't prohibit it in the commercial agricultural zone within the coastal zone in one mile. There's a different set of regulations on new construction within that area. So the white area that you see with the, I don't know what that color would be, but I guess pink, that is about 98% within my district, shows that the overwhelming amount of uh, CA zoned eligible land actually falls within the second district. The green area that you're speaking of specifically just happens to be zoning that's outside of that coastal zone plus one mile buffer, which has a different set of regulations on, for example, new construction of uh, structures. So uh, it, it's not prevented by any stretch. And in fact, a number of the people that spoke today live in the second district, have greenhouses or other facilities within the second district that intend to and have registered to uh, grow. So it, it, it will definitely be within, the majority of it will be commercial activity will be within our two districts, that's a fact. But I just wanna uh, make sure you understand the map. The map isn't saying that the white area is an area that's precluded, it's actually allowed. Uh, it's just within a different designation of some of the rules and requirements that fall under that map. <clears throat> but it does show where future uh, production actually could take place. Because when you talk about existing greenhouses and existing uh, uh, production, uh, it, it, it is uh, pertinent to uh, the map here with the CA land. So cultivation is allowed on CA zone land per the terms of the ordinance. So what, what is your question? Yeah, okay, I have, uh, I'm outside the one mile buffer. Everybody else has the one mile buffer, right? Except for uh, District 5. And then also when it comes to uh, uh, setbacks and everything else on new or existing uh, greenhouses, that, that's gonna be, a f uh, that's gonna affect District 4 more than any other district. I, I can't answer that question, but I want to make sure that you understand that, that it can be grown on CA properties within the one mile buffer in existing greenhouses the, to make sure that we're communicating with each other. Uh -huh. Okay, because a second ago I thought you said that it couldn't be grown on CA land within the one mile buffer. And that's not, that's not it, correct. It, uh, if it's in an existing greenhouse. Yes. Right. So it could be grown within the one mile buffer if it's in an existing greenhouse. Yes. Okay, which is not gonna change them at all. What about uh, existing greenhouses in CA land in District 4? Is there gonna be more greenhouses? 
I don't know how many greenhouses there are in District 4. Okay. I, I haven't seen an analysis of that being done as um, with District 4 as opposed to any other district. Um, so I just don't have the I don't have the answer, unfortunately. But staff may have a staff may have an answer. It's not really a legal question. Okay. It's, I mean, there are a lot of, of factors that will that will go into determining, you know, who ends up coming in and applying for licenses. Um, not every landlord wants to deal with cannabis. So um, while it, it's true that there are probably more existing greenhouses in District 4, that doesn't mean that um, the overwhelming number of, of licensees will will be in, in any particular district, right? We but have how many licenses could actually come from uh, District, uh, we'll say three, and District five, um, and District uh, one? I mean, it's, I mean, look at the map, I mean, right there. Well, these are potentially eligible par parcels, right? And this, this particular map deals with one set of variables, um, depending on the ordinance that, that you know, we land on, um, it's not just CA, of course. There are other zone districts that, that are allowed and there are just, there are too many variables for, for us to definitively say who's gonna apply and who's not. Uh, Supervisor Caput, I, I don't remember this uh, similar concern when we were talking about dispensaries where three quarters of the dispensaries are in District 1. And if you're saying that we, we, that, that we should the, the uh, taxes generated should go to the, the, the district, we would have a lot more taxes being generated in, gen in District 1 on this. The, there's a shared burden that we have here as a community. Um, and in, in District 1, we may not have a lot of CA zone land, but we have a lot of residential land. And this board has, uh, has uh, supported efforts to increase the density in those areas. And, and our planning rules say that we're gonna grow plants in the rural areas, and we've zoned the land CA, um, and so you would expect that plants would be grown in CA zone land, and housing would be built in, 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 in the residential zone land. So that's how we, ba that's how we balance this all out as a county uh, through our general plan and the zonings therein. Right, <clears throat> and then we get down to uh, the ag land again, and whether, you know, we're talking about local uh, uh, ag land, probably the best in the world uh, based on quality of soil. And uh, then, then it comes down to, uh, uh, you know, the nursery effect that was mentioned with the flowering of plants. I would like to see uh, some of that combined in the same, you know, existing greenhouses. Uh, where you, just like a nursery, where if I was to go buy a, a bush or a plant, uh, they say, well, we have the one gallons over here and we got the five gallon over here and we got the, uh, you know, the bigger plants over here. It's all in one place rather than spread out. So uh, how do we, how do we, bur uh, we're eliminating uh, uh, stress on egg land if we have it more locally, uh, centralized than rather than spread out. Well, that, that's the way it is now in our, in our, in the current draft ordinance that you have before you, we've basically created a box and you can put whatever you want in the box and you can call it whatever you want. You can call it mature, you can call it flowering, you can call it nursery, you can call it immature. Um, for purposes of our staff, it's very difficult for them to enforce uh, a code uh, that's based on principles that don't reflect local concerns. And basically what we're hearing is that, is, that, is that certain folks would like to change the definitions in the code, in our code, to model the state code. But the state code, when it was drafted, wasn't concerned with the issues that our staff was concerned with in drafting our code. And so, um, it's, it's kind of like trying to, 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 fit a, to fit a circle into a square in some respects. Um, that's staff's perspective. Um, other people can you know, have other opinions and your board is free to make whatever decisions it, it, it wants to make on those issues. And then we have uh, the uh, issue of odor, uh, near, uh, especially near residential ag. Uh, we had one gentleman mention, you know, quarter mile, but I mean, wow, that must be the uh, direction of the wind too. But it also comes down to how much. Uh, so 
how, how are we protecting uh, residential ag that is close by commercial ag? Uh, and I'm thinking of the Wheelock area off of uh, Green Valley Road near Monta Vista School. There's a community there, uh, and that's the dividing line of District 4. Uh, how, do we, how do we protect them from, uh, you know, that, uh, the odor that's coming in? Uh, what, it would have to be in a greenhouse, right? Well, I'm gonna direct that question to staff because they've done a ton of research on, um, on odor prevention, including, you know, what's being done in other states and the like. Well, as I said in my opening remarks, that odor is, is a, a big problem, particularly for outdoor growth. So we're not requiring folks to be indoors um, at this point. Um, so it, it is easy-ish to mitigate an indoor uh, grow, but for outdoor, we've, we've looked and talked to other jurisdictions and, and there's no sort of silver bullet. There is um, a, a measuring device that is used in Colorado, but to our, um, as far as our research indicates, that's only been used for indoor grows. They've never applied that to outdoor grows in terms of how they measure. So, right. so we didn't recommend going with that. It's certainly something that we can look at. But the outdoor grow would be in the CA land. Outdoor, not that's not restricted. And, and to that's why CA I'm getting land. back to that map. You know, on page 16, where. Uh, the outdoor, outdoor grow uh, could uh, actually have a, an effect, odor effect on the residential ag. It, it certainly could have an effect in a number of, of different situations, but uh, so could uh, a legal personal grow that we don't regulate of six plants that can be grown right up to the property line. So it will be difficult for us to to act on anything that is just an odor complaint. If somebody complains, we will track, we will monitor, we will look at where the complaints are coming from. And as I indicated earlier, if we need to modify uh, somebody's license because we're receiving an inordinate number of complaints about the odor, they may have to move back. We may have to increase the setback. They may, in a worst case scenario, either not get a renewal or have to go indoors. It really is site specific. Okay. And uh, one that uh, affects actually another district more than all the others, and I, I am concerned about it, that, uh, that it is protected, and that would be uh, timber production. Uh, the redwood forests, uh, uh, are the greatest carbon banking uh, trees in the, in the entire world. And uh, if, if we're cutting down redwood trees in order to put in uh, uh, marijuana grow, uh, that's gonna have a tremendous stress and effect yeah. on the environment of Santa Cruz County. So uh, uh, we do have uh, redwood uh, trees and production in District 4 but uh, how strict are we gonna be on that? I, I wanna make sure we don't ruin uh, one of the greatest parts of our county. Well, we're not allowing any new cultivation sites to occur in timber production. There, the, the carve out that we have um, recognizes that there are some existing uh, cannabis uh, cultivation sites um, those we would review, but they would also have to pass all of the other thresholds and, and, and pass you know, fires review and, and everybody else before they would be able to secure a license. So there is no new development under the current draft in, in timber production. And the, uh, the effect of water diversion uh, could affect actually the growth and uh, health of uh, trees in the uh, neighboring areas. Every licensed applicant will have to submit uh, a, a water efficiency plan and they will have to designate where they get their water and that will be reviewed by, by uh, our county as well as the state. And those requirements are, are, are pretty strict. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and here, here's uh, pretty much wrapping it up. A future habitable uh, structure. Let's say I have RA land and uh, I want to put a, uh, I want to put a ADU or what, I want to put something on it. But before I put out my plans, somebody in that CA land has a, uh, 
uh, marijuana grow, cannabis grow, that is within the uh, 200 feet mm -hmm. uh, buffer zone. I, I, are they gonna, they're gonna have the right to keep it there or are they gonna have to move if I get the okay to build some kind of a structure, habitable structure? The setback, the, the setback to habitable structures would not impact anybody's ability on an adjacent parcel to construct a, a structure. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that the neighbor who may have established a cannabis grow uh, is, is, there, is precluded from getting a renewal. We, okay. would, we would evaluate sure. it like we do everything else. Remember, these are annual. So every year we will be looking to see um, about impacts of, of all sorts. But, um, but there's no de facto um, you know, prohibition against somebody who's already established, but you're more than, more than willing and able to, to so come they, in and apply they, for your ADU. They could build restriction. within the uh, buffer zone, but they would have to put up with the, uh, uh, the marijuana grow. To some extent, that would be true. Yeah. Well, I guess it's more than to some extent, it's probably true. absolutely, yeah. Okay. And I think that pretty much, uh, uh, I want to thank you for all the work and every, everybody's effort. I, uh, I will wrap this up by saying uh, when it was medical marijuana uh, three, four years ago, we've been talking about this. I was, uh, I was uh, one of the number one, uh, you know, uh, number one in agreement with everybody else on doing something because of the uh, humanitarian part of it and everything. Now we're dealing with recreational um, uh, cannabis and that's because the state did vote for it, but also the state did put burdens on us as a county. I, uh, I'm concerned about, uh, you know, cannabis is a drug. We're not talking about a strawberry or a raspberry. And uh, so I, uh, uh, I see the benefits and I see also the, uh, you know, drawbacks, but uh, recreation, recreational use, uh, I don't want to see my kids doing it and I don't really, uh, uh, I feel for other families. It's getting harder and harder to raise a family uh, with uh, pressure from all kinds of things. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I just think we have to keep in mind we're dealing with a, uh, an actual drug and we do have to be careful when it comes to recreational use uh, rather than medical use. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor uh, Caput. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Friend. I, I wanted to make a, just a general statement about um, and then some suggestions on the 18 recommendations from the Planning Commission and then uh, a couple other directives, if I might, uh, that I would like to see included in any motion that would come up. And I think that we should all speak before a motion is made and then go f uh, on that uh, plane. Um, this has been a long haul. I mean, it's been more than 20 years since medicinal marijuana was approved in this state. And then, of course, uh, just over a year ago, voters approved the recreational use. and. Uh, we have come a long way, and I can't t tell you how much I appreciate it. It's, it's been mentioned already with the Planning Commission and that day-long uh, uh, nightmare that they had to go through to get us to this position to get focused on what we need to do here. Uh, I want to thank the Planning Commission, uh, the Cannabis Licensing Office, um, also the, the C4 committee that took uh, some years to, to oversee this too. Thank you very much, because we really needed all that input. Um, uh, the, um, you know, what we're with now, uh, is it too lenient or is it too strict? I guess that depends on the eyes of the speaker. So uh, it's not going to be perfect in the eyes of uh, many, probably most, but we have an obligation now to implement a, an ordinance and a policy that will best serve uh, the county of Santa Cruz and its residents. Uh, the overarching concern uh, continues to be um, what will com commercial cannabis operations have, the impact it will have on residential areas, as well as the protection of our natural resources. Um, and as far as the county budget's concerned, um, it's becoming very evident that um, this uh, result of this uh, 
green rush of a few years ago is not gonna result in a gold mine for the Santa Cruz County budget. And uh, it's gonna be a lot of effort that's going to be, have to be done by a multiple uh, departments to, to enforce this and do it correctly. And um, then how the revenues are deposited is still a very serious question that's going to have to have oversight from the state and federal level as well. But at this point, I'd like to direct my attention again to the recommendations by the Planning Commission. And without verbalizing on each of them, I'd like to say that I do support their recommendations one through six, nine, uh, 11 with the caveat, and uh, 13 through 18, with 14 also the date of that uh, concern. Um, on the five proposals that uh, I've mentioned, um, Number seven, I think the, the planning commission's intent is, is good, but I believe the staff option to increase the outdoor cultivation of habitable structures on neighboring parcels uh, to 400 feet is acceptable. Uh, I think that would be proper for neighborhood protection in particular. Um, on number eight, I think we should allow both suggested options that the planning commission uh, put for, to us and that would be to allow a limited subset of class two extraction processes. Uh, that is the activities don't uh, involve ethanol or C CO2 extraction on rural agri uh, agricultural zone properties. Um, I think we should allow class two extraction on larger RA zone properties uh, or with increased setbacks uh, to neighboring properties. That was uh, number eight in the two options that were mentioned. On number 10, I support the staff recommendation to reduce the land use process to level four, which maintains public noticing requirement, but no, not the time and expense of a public hearing. As was mentioned, we have hundreds, 750,000. Uh, we need to get through these as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And uh, it would be a bureaucratic nightmare, I think, to try to do this uh, following level five uh, standards. And I also think we should allow level four review for all cannabis cultivation operations under 10 acres. Um, on 11 and 14, I think we need, I think it's important we have some consistency about the dates that we're using. And it's 2013 or 16, I think 2013 seems the best, but I would be open to other discussion from my colleagues. Um, and then that was for the two on uh, items 11 to 14. On number 12, um, I agree, but I just wanted to ask, is there a reason uh, other eligible property owners and other than commercial ag uh, zones can't have the same consideration as is allowed on that number 12? Uh, well, this speaks uh, sp uh, specifically to the eligibility requirement for farmers. So, right, so the eligibility extends to folks who either registered or folks who had been farming for non-cannabis farming. Um, and so th the way it was worded, it wasn't clear that that would include property owners of farms who didn't themselves uh, participate, if that makes okay. sense. So landlords. Okay, I think, I think that's clear then. <laughs> Um, and if, if, if it's not, if the, uh, my colleagues think we need uh, further uh, clarification, I'd be open to that. Okay, I, it's, so I, the, um, the recommendation would, would be fine on 12. Um, um, I, I um, additionally, well, I, I think, think it's important uh, that was mentioned that this does not allow new production on timber zones. Uh, at, at this time, so I, I think that needs to be made clear, and we have. Um, there's a, a couple other directives. Um, the statement about the definition of a canopy, I think it, to have some consistency with the state, it would be important, and I think we should, uh, we should, we should uh, integrate that in our policies as well. Uh, I'm not saying that we should follow everything the state has said, but I think that would be a, the right move for us to do as a county. Um, in uh, addition, um, just a few other things, I'd, a, a couple directives or suggestions I would have that above and beyond what the, um, 
the Planning Commission uh, mentioned uh, to, uh, I think that we should allow for provisional authorization of uh, local operators who are in good standing, and you know who they are at this point, while they seek approval from the Planning Department uh, and the Cannabis Licensing Office. So we've got a tight time squeeze here. I, I don't wanna be, uh, I think we wanna just be fair, and I don't think this is gonna call, uh, create a new rush, so to speak, because we know where these uh, operations are located. Um, I would like to also, um, as a directive, um, and not part of a motion maybe, but, well, but just to a suggestion to direct staff to continue working on the, uh, with the industry and state officials on how to provide and protect compassionate use programs. Uh, and I, I'm hearing my county council say, wait, well, just stop right there and don't go any further than that. And I, I agree. This is going to have to be a state, um, Santa Cruz County uh, uh, state decision, and we need to be part of that. And I would very much like to be part of that and engage with the state legislators, uh, departments who are doing this to see how we can implement that. And Santa Cruz County is a shining... <laughs> We know that Santa Cruz County is a shining example of how that works and how it can work well. So I, I would like to just suggest that um, direct staff uh, to, we'll just keep on, on top of this and uh, promote it at the state level and so we can implement it as need be. And finally, uh, to direct the staff to re report back uh, quarterly and maybe you think would be semi-annually, but uh, to be reasonable about what we're gonna be, uh, what the rush is gonna be here on the number and types of license applications and approvals and information on the most common obstacles regarding legality. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't know if quarterly is too, you've got enough on your plate, but I'd like to be reasonable about it, but certainly semi-annually, but I, I would, Quarterly, I'd prefer to have a report on that. So those would be the three directives I would like to have on top of my opinion on um, what the Planning Commission has recommended and what we've heard from the audience today. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Thank you for walking through those items, too. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Um, I, I guess I don't have any questions. I, I, it's hard to follow where we're gonna end up, so maybe, maybe we could just if we could work through after, if you all have any questions, but then we work through each of the planning commission recommendations or bunch some together in a group, move forward. Because I, I, I have comments, but I, but I probably prefer to wait until we have each, okay. each one of these items in front of us. Okay, I will come back to you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, um, thanks to the staff uh, for uh, working on this. You know, we've only been at the cultivation uh, license efforts for about five years. Um, <laughs> we've been, d uh, I, I think the first letter we brought to about uh, dispensaries was uh, eight years ago. So um, having a state regulatory system allows us to better move towards the, our final square here, which is to have a good set of regulations, and I feel as though we're very close by what we have here. I appreciate the public input we have consistently received on all sides of this issue uh, to come to where we are today. Um, that We took hours and hours of public testimony. W we've uh, put together uh, the C4 committee to hear from many different voices. They spent um, hours and hours and hours and hours trying to come up with uh, um, uh, recommendations which were incorporated in our ordinance and then we took more testimony about, uh, about what people uh, thought about this. So this is, um, whether you like what we have here or not, this has been a very inclusive process. And it, it's uh, emblematic of who we are as Santa Cruz, which is we try to uh, bring in uh, different voices uh, and ensure that every voice is heard. And I think as we continue to do these final steps to put an ordinance in place, um, I, I think it's gonna reflect um, the community well, even if your particular item isn't included. Uh, it, you, th the efforts that we've made to include all these voices are important uh, to how this board is gonna end up voting on it. The, I thought that the Planning Commission did a very uh, good job in uh, over their two meetings um, uh, to come up with a series of recommendations the most of which I support. 
I think that, uh, uh, in, in talking with my planning commissioner, planning commissioner, he he uh, told me he goes, I'm not really happy with the legislative role you've given us. Um, <laughs> that that's really our responsibility here as a board. Um, but we gave them some legislative responsibilities, and I thought that they approached it, and some of the the solutions they came up with were very good. And I and I think that reflected the input that they received um, from people. I think it's important to note that uh, unlike other entitlements that the county gives, these licenses are only of one year in duration. Um, and that gives us uh, a chance to make changes where we haven't gotten things right. Uh, and I wanna encourage people uh, to, to think that we have a good set of environmental regulations and what we are trying to do here is bring people into a system uh, that, um, that will be regulated and will help us reach the greatest uh, level of environmental uh, protection as we can. Um, I think that there are parts of what the uh, Planning Commission's recommendations that work really well, and there are some parts that don't. This uh, item number seven, uh, which is uh, allowing uh, property owners within a thousand feet to have um, a say in uh, what happens on someone's property is, uh, it, it doesn't work. Uh, I think it's, it's an open invitation to extortion. Uh, I think that if, uh, if I didn't like something or if I wanted to get a free cannabis or if I wanted, uh, something from my neighbor, I have a big stick uh, to wield, and I'm not sure of the legality of that, I'll let, I'll let the lawyers decide. Um, but I think that, uh, I talked with our agricultural commissioner, and you can spray pesticides on your property, and all you have to do is notice your neighbors. And uh, when we look at that, uh, the idea of odor uh, is much more subjective than uh, the uh, chemicals that are involved in pesticide spraying. So I don't think we should have um, higher uh, regulations around something like odor than we do for uh, uh, chemicals uh, that we know can kill you if you have too much. Uh, and so I think that in, in uh, of all the recommendations, I don't support this one. Um, I'm not sure that f uh, a larger buffer in any way uh, helps or not. Uh, I think that th that's the goal of a, of a one-year license is to be able to come back and say, it's not the fear of that smelling on my property, it's the experience of smelling on my property. Uh, and we'll have a better sense about that um, uh, once we hear from people. Um, these outdoor uh, growing periods are uh, basically once a year um, uh, and so there will be um, a limited period of time where that smell, uh, if it's a problem, would be a problem, and then we have an annual review process where uh, those kind of uh, impacts could be taken into account. So uh, I'm, uh, I would be comfortable leaving out seven uh, completely. I also think that uh, what we've been trying to do with these regulations is to allow uh, commercial at recognizing that we would prefer uh, these cultivation, commercial cultivations, to, uh, to um, happen in places where we've designated commercial agriculture activity to happen, which is why we're trying to set a lower bar for commercial ag zone parcels, uh, because uh, in our general plan process and what we thought and what people, when they purchase property, uh, understood is they were next to a commercial ag operation. And so I think it makes sense to keep those bars low. I also think that we should uh, uh, expand our viewpoint on several other zone parcels um, and reduce the barriers because if it's not gonna be on commercial ag and we want it and it's gonna be grown indoor, uh, we look at M1 or C4 parcels even C2 parcels, these are commercially zoned parcels um, in which we have, in which the growing is gonna occur indoor, in which we have um, restrictions in place or um, um, requirements in place 
that would require scrubbing of the smells so it doesn't impact. Um, when I looked at the M1 uh, zone parcels, there's only about 75 in, in the county. Uh, all but three of them are in my district. And so I looked at each one of these parcels and for the vast majority of them, they are surrounded by commercial, other commercial areas. Um, and so I think that we as a, as a board should say, if, we, if people are gonna grow this plant and they're not gonna grow it on CA, M uh, zone parcels make sense. Um, and I think it was, a, a, we should look at these legal nonconforming uh, uh, structures that are there because the, I have them all over uh, my district, I th as we all do. And I think we should give some discretion to the cannabis licensing officer to make it a, a, a judgment about uh, what the impact would be. Because if um, you look at the SoCal Research Park, which is generally surrounded by all commercial activity, there is a house, legal nonconforming, that's there. Um, but we have identified that, and for all intents and purposes, we've zoned the area for commercial activity. Um, the, someone is, uh, there's a house there, there's been a house there for a long time. Uh, we should be promoting commercial activity in that area. And so I think we should lower the bar for that, and, uh, and frankly, I would do it for C4 and C2 um, as well, and have a, uh, uh, not have to go to uh, level five, um, and be treated the same way as CA. I think that, I think that makes sense for us. Um, the, uh, the, the question about the process, I think, is a real one. Um, and I, it's a real one uh, just because uh, we have set up a system where we told people that if you registered, uh, uh, that, uh, that we were gonna limit the registration to those people who uh, registered for a license. And um, that some of those people have made choices um, and have started the statewide process. I'm not completely clear on, um, on uh, the state uh, licensing process. But when I see the number, when I look at that 750 number, and when I see the number of people who have to go through a level five process, <coughs> I question whether the, um, we have the resources to be able to do that effectively. Um, and uh, we, one of the things we've always tried to do is try to sync this up with the state process to ensure that, that we had something that worked for people who were trying to follow the rules. And so um, having a level five process for everything to me seems completely impractical. Clearly to me, um, the commercially zoned properties of CA, um, of uh, M, of C2 and C4 uh, should not uh, have to go to that level. Um, and I think you can make a, a, a case that um, even RA zoned parcels shouldn't be required to go it, but if there's notice and, and uh, either the supervisor or, the, um, or they get uh, a lot of concerns raised by residents, that that could be kicked up to a, a level uh, five process. We do that for um, uh, vacation rentals, where if people uh, have a, get the notice that a vacation rental's coming, we, uh, it, and they can tell us that there's a, been a problem with that already, that we kick that up. I think that's a model that works, and I think it's something we should consider um, as a board. Um, I do think that when this comes back in April, that the, the cannabis licensing office and planning should provide us with some information about how they're gonna deal with this. Um, I think that uh, in our effort to, to try to bring this to a place where, again, people who are trying to follow the rules can actually follow the rules, and there's this temporary license from the state, and there's a certain number of days and everything, we should be clear about how we're gonna do this. You know, and during the Great Recession, uh, we got an extraordinary number of assessment appeals. Um, and so what do we do? We appointed a second assessment appeals board to try to process those. And that may be one of the strategies we wanna look at on a, t on a temporary basis 
uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to honor the process that we set out and expedite it as well. And so uh, it would be helpful, um, and I think we should make a direction, is to hear from the staff about their uh, ideas about w how this is going to be addressed and to give people an expectation <coughs> about how long things are going to take. Um, and I think we, as we, can ba we can find balance to um, meeting people's concerns and also expediting it if there's some thoughtfulness that go on in there. That may involve some uh, temporary reassignments or some temporary uh, staffing or something to be able to move through this first period uh, that we're going through. I support uh, 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 Supervisor McPherson's uh, efforts to try to get us to look at the compassionate use. Um, I think uh, uh, while there's not much that we can do as we wait for the state uh, to make changes, we could direct our chair to write a letter uh, uh, to the appropriate le legislators or, or, or departments uh, indicating our interest in wanting to have a clear set of rules to allow the compassionate uh, use to continue um, as has happened here in Santa Cruz for many decades successfully and, and meeting the needs. I think we should do everything we can. We've heard that there's no one who speaks against it, um, and we should use the power of our office in order to make that happen. So I look forward to, uh, uh, well, I guess the one last thing is the question of definition. This was something that we talked about when we met here February 6th, and uh, I'm still uh, interested in having our definition sync up with the state definition. I do think that that's a, a good suggestion. I think uh, the testimony we heard from members of the Farm Bureau today um, highlight that, uh, that with training, it should be an easy way for us to define this um, and will cause a lot less problems for us down the line. And so I, I encourage the, uh, the, the alignment of our definition of canopy and nursery with the state definition. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Um, let me just begin by thanking all of you for the civility and constructive tone of today's meeting. Overall, this has been a very productive discussion over the last few years, and I do appreciate uh, that we're working toward a resolution here. I have a couple of questions of uh, staff about what it would mean to implement some of the things that my colleagues are asking for, and then I'll get in to discuss uh, through the Planning Commission's recommendations the things that uh, I'm aligned with because we may, as Supervisor Coonerty had noted, be able to take a chunk of it at once and then move on an item by item. But we had a discussion, we had a discussion in February about what it would mean to align the canopy definition as the state. There were concerns about what that would be. Um, we directed staff to look at that. There's language in our ordinance now that, or the proposed ordinance, I should say, that I, I believe addresses actually the concerns of both the environmental need as well as uh, meeting the needs of the Farm Bureau and the nurseries, but and could one of you either uh, on the legal side or the, or the non-legal side, although when I look at here, literally everybody sitting up here is actually a lawyer from what I gather, <laughs> but if, <laughs> it's a lot of lawyers right here. Uh, if, if you could explain uh, to the board the rationale for why we weren't aligned with the state uh, definition, that would be useful, I think, for us to understand. I think the canopy uh, actually, the canopy definition, except for the, the stacking provision that we added, um, does align with the states, uh, by and large, right, in terms of... It, it, the, the, the only... Let me, let me just jump yeah, in there. Sure. The, the, way, the way that it, it, it differs um, uh, is in uh, a lack of acknowledgement of immature the plants. Right. That's, that's, that's the distinction. Right. The, 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 but the... 90% of the definition of canopy that we have is right in line with CDFA. And the rationale for that is? The rationale for that is that your board selected limits on what it wanted cannabis, a cannabis farm to look like, right? And, 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 and it's strewn throughout our code. And it was negotiated by C4. These limits were discussed, debated, et cetera. Um, you landed on them. <laughs> And, it, and staff does not want to be responsible for changing those. That's a major policy distinction, to open up something that your board had given us direction on. If you, if you want a cannabis farm to look like 5,000 uh, square feet in a specific place, um, our version of that is that 
that's the amount of space that you want cannabis plants in, regardless of whether they're called immature, mature, flowering, nursery, uh, whatever. If your board wants to change that, there's a variety of ways that you could do that. I mean, you could lift the limits um, and say it, uh, that, um, that lift, lift the limits and then say that 25% is gonna be devoted to what you call nursery stock and that we can come up with a nursery definition of non-flowering. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that, is that um, staff has been concerned, and we've said it numerous times, about the enforceability of with stretched resources trying to deal with what is an immature versus a mature versus a flowering versus a non-flowering plant. And um, well, there's not much more to say about it other than, no, other than what it's, it's, well, That's useful, I appreciate that. I mean, the point is, because what I've heard both in February and today is sort of mm -hmm. this sense that it's just a simple thing, just a line, and it's not that big of a deal. But, I, but there's generally a, a policy rationale in a five-year process <laughs> as to why we landed where we did. It's generally not always the best idea to just arbitrarily from the dais just make a change that could have a pretty significant change to a policy across the board until you've actually had a policy in effect. One of the things that's been discussed is there's a year review, well, uh, there's a year uh, licensing component to this, uh, then I think that from a policy rationale perspective, we should, we should really narrow in on what we've been narrowing in on for quite some time. And if it's needed uh, to be broadened moving forward, it can be broadened. But I, but I think it's actually a pretty significant shift, which is why I wanted to ask for that clarification. I, I wouldn't be supportive of, of doing that now, uh, but I think that, because I think that we've come a long way to ensure that those needs are met, but I, I appreciate that component. Of course, it is within the board's purview should we need uh, to change it, which is important. Chair, I would, so just, uh, I, I would just say, although we've been in this process, the C4 committee was, I think, formed in 2016 or something. Um, you know, the state didn't have its definition of canopy until relatively recently. And that, you know, the, the, the benefit of having a statewide regulatory uh, structure is it starts, it, it creates the box in which we will operate in. And, and so as a reflection of that, it gives us a chance to refine what we've done. I, I understand your concerns, but I don't think it's a, it's a gross uh, um, uh, ch change to say we're gonna we're gonna sync up with, with the state uh, definition. I, I respect that. I, I just I have a different view on that issue, but I think that that's something that the board will obviously take up. Uh, I have a follow up on, on just that just point. briefly because I am trying to go through all these sure. uh, items. I'll, I'll make it brief. Uh, with the canopy, if we're talking about centralizing and having that would make it a lot easier to enforce. Also, when there's an inspection. If you're looking at uh, the seedlings, then you're looking at larger plants, flowering plants. <laughs> if they're in a canopy and they're all, that's part of stacking, right? It makes it a lot easier rather than somebody trying to inspect one site over here for seedlings and one site over somewhere else. Right, as, as the plants mature, it, it would be a bit onerous for us to try to figure out when something had moved. And yes, plant by plant you can tell, but when you're looking at potentially hundreds or thousands of plants, it's a little different. What we really envisioned and, and what would be easiest for us would be to provide a box and say it's up to the individual cultivator to decide how they fill their box. We allowed stacking for, uh, for very small plants and, and, and the idea was that you wouldn't be penalized for having multiple layers. We wouldn't count all of those. We also reduced the, the minimum parcel size for the CA property uh, to have essentially unlimited canopy with co-location with, the, again, the idea that we would incentivize uh, using existing structures and, and co-location to provide a greater canopy limits so that if somebody wanted to devote uh, a big chunk of their, their business to nurseries, they would have uh, adequate space for that. But just to be clear, the, the, the state when they look at nurseries, they're looking at exclusively nurseries, like that is your business, that's all you do. And in that respect, the state says no canopy limit. Um, but they're also not looking at land use and, and what it looks like to have you know, new development to, to uh, encompass that. Um, so a lot of what we've been talking about is propagation where you have businesses that start from small and grow all the way to maturation, but that's a little bit of a different model than somebody who does nothing but nurseries. So if that's your business model, then we would just assume you take the canopy limits that we've provided for and use that 
for your nursery. All right, thank you. So moving forward to just on some clarifications, as Supervisor McPherson had noted an interest in a provisional authorization. Can you just tell me operationally what that would actually mean, what that would look like? Um, it, it could take different forms. What It could be an extension of what we have been doing with the, with the letters that we've been providing where we basically say that um, a, an actor is in good standing, they've paid their taxes. In this case, we once we have uh, ordinance language, we would know more about whether they comply with the basic um, the zoning restrictions and, and parcel sizes and, and so forth. It is possible, although we haven't gotten there yet, that folks could resubmit the letters that they already have, those folks who have come through and, and obtained those from us. We could create, there's a placeholder for it, um, something that we call sort of provisional or some something where we sort of park folks while they work their way through, for instance, a level five process where they've satisfied our requirements, they've s satisfied some level of like completeness or something like that, um, and we give them something that they can then take to the state to, uh, to submit and, and, and obtain an annual license from the state. Okay, thank you. So I'll walk through just some of these items and I'll move back to Supervisor Coonerty, I, I, I think to, to try and start moving toward uh, action on these items. Um, I, uh, well, actually one last thing, I do have maybe just a slight concern on the CA, the 20 to 10 acre component. I don't have an issue with necessarily re the reduction we don't, uh, we have uh, something that exempts all CA from requiring any <coughs> odor requirements at all. You don't have to have a scrubber, for example, in an indoor uh, grow within CA property. Uh, once we start reducing this down to 10 acres, I, I mean, it, basically what we're saying is, is that anything can go on a CA property, and I've been uh, very supportive of, of encouraging this in proper zoned areas. But CA is adjacent in many areas in my district to residential areas. Uh, so if we're gonna have o no odor mitigation requirements at all on CA, and we're gonna reduce the acreage, this is I think gonna cause an issue. And if it, if it means that you're allowed to at the year review it, but I don't see the tools by which the cannabis licensing officer, when we functionally exempted CA from all these requirements, would necessarily be able to create a mitigation that would then stick, I think that we're actually creating an externality that we didn't really think of, mm -hmm. and I have a concern about within that component. So I think that, I mean, the number one complaint we get is, is in regards to odor, and I think it's something that, that the board should take seriously. Um, <coughs> there are limited things that you can actually grow on CA in this side of the hill. For example, some of the more uh, scented elements, say like a Gilroy growing garlic or some of the green onions would not actually succeed on this side of the hill in the same way. So people that are living even in those areas aren't used to um, the level of odor that we could be creating if a disproportionate amount of these grows occur in CA and we have no mitigations associated with it. So I would like to see that there actually be a process for ensuring mitigation, something that actually allows a review uh, of the licensing officer to create or require. I'm still in favor of scrubbers in, in CA. I recognize that, that, that my colleagues didn't support that in February, but uh, I think that we should have some element that recognizes that we could be creating a situation moving forward uh, as I believe a disproportionate number of these grows just based on all the other elements that we are doing today uh, will move towards CA. And so that's my concern about the reduction of the 20 to 10. Um, I don't know what, how we would do that and I don't know how to really articulate that into a motion, but right now it's just left out there where it's a functional exemption. And I think that's gonna be problematic because it's also an enforceability enforce, issue moving forward. Uh, regarding odor on non-CA lands, uh, I'm supportive of what Supervisor McPherson had noted on the 400 feet. I think Supervisor Leopold has a point. I'm not sure if 200 to 400 feet would necessarily make a significant difference uh, because it's basically the size of a football field and during that time of, of um, when it is uh, blooming, I think that 400 feet may also not be enough, but I think that we need to make a statement in our code of, of an expectation that to the degree possible odors are contained on site and because of that we have uh, these setback requirements that allow for additional mitigations if need be by the cannabis licensing uh, officer. Can I'm you clarify that? I, uh, you were talking about 400 feet? The planning staff made a recommendation, so the planning commission made a recommendation that seems uh, uh, 
nearly impossible to enforce, which is this sign-off requirement of, a, of people within 1,000 feet. Uh, there are other concerns, not just of the enforceability of it, about whether uh, it's a reasonable aspect, but I think that it, in and of itself, we should create something that allows for uh, odor to be considered with the seriousness that I think that the community has with it. Uh, one of the recommendations of planning staff is to ha increase our 200 foot setbacks of habitable to 400 foot, uh, which is something Supervisor McPherson so also So it could be expanded to 400 feet? That's a proposal in front right. of you from the planning staff, a recommend, well not a recommendation, but, but an option presented by the planning staff in front of you today. That's, that's big, I, yeah, I like that. Um, so I agree too on the date consistent as 2013, it's already that way in the timber zone. I, I feel like the code should harmonize that throughout. I don't think it makes sense to have the 2016 date. Um, I also agree that the no duty to enforce language has uh, um, created an unnecessary amount of consternation within the community, unnecessarily so, so we should uh, just get rid of it. Um, the 24 hour comment line isn't really actually a realistic option. I mean, there is, no one's gonna be staffing at 24 hours a day. It kind of creates an unreasonable expectation. What we, I mean, we, we currently have, I guess in theory, a 24 hour uh, ability to submit through online or uh, when we expand it to the Citizen Connect. So I don't, I, I understand what the Planning Commission is trying to say on that, but I don't know that operationally it necessarily makes sense. I am actually comfortable, I understand and hear what my colleagues and the community has said regarding the higher level of review, but uh, I feel that the highest level of review uh, is actually reasonable, and, and I'll explain a little bit why. On level five, we currently actually have in our code that uh, most home occupations actually require level five now. So if you view a cottage grow as a home occupation, and considering it's gonna be commercial activity in a non-commercial area, um, you would have to get a level five if you were doing another home oc at your house, and yet we're now saying that apparently it's too onerous to do that for a commercial cannabis activity there. And so maybe the board, to be consistent, should either consider uh, the other components of our code on level five review on home occupations, or we should say that uh, there was a reason by which we created that as a level five to, to start with. We have a level five for a fence height over six feet. Uh, we have a level five for for having a trailer installed on an agricultural parcel that someone's going to live in. We have a level five for an ADU that's over 640 square feet. We have a level five for a lot of things that I think a lot of people would consider pretty de minimis as far as what they are. So I don't consider a level five review on a new commercial activity uh, to be onerous, but I understand that that may not be uh, shared by my colleagues, but I wanted to, I wanted to explain why it was that I had advocated for level five in the first place, and I think it harmonizes with other elements in the code. So moving this uh, back to you, Supervisor Coonerty, I do see, uh, based on everybody's comments, and I've been tried to write them down, a relative consistency on there are things that we actually uh, might be able to get through without having to do individual motions. And so please go ahead and make your comments, and then I think that, there are, that we can take a chunk of this in, in, a, in a motion and then go through on individual points. Yeah, that's, well, so I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna make a motion, <coughs> um, and I'll, just for the clarity of the, public and everyone involved, so item number, uh, this would be items one through six, 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. Well, that, let's say that and, slowly. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna walk through each one because I think people, because not everyone's working from the Can same numbers. Say those numbers again. <clears throat> one through six, They're all through. 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. So, let me read those so that everybody knows, which is to delete the du no duty to enforce provision. To retain all required, that's number one. Number two, retain uh, the requirement for the mandatory site inspections as part of the initial review of all licenses. Three, retain the riparian setback provisions and retain the use of the riparian ex uh, exception provisions. Uh, require the best management and operations practices include language to ensure that water purveyors use truck water uh, are legal operators. Five, uh, include language to clarify that cannabis license official will determine and or declare water emergencies. Uh, six, eliminate exceptions to the minimum parcel size allowance. Twelve is uh, allow property owners of CA properties to qualify for a license application regardless of whether they actually farm the property. 13, remove the Q zone designated sites from eligibility for commercial cannabis. 
Uh, 16 is to reduce the minimum parcel size from 20 acres to 10 acres for CA zone parcels when existing structures are used for co-location or master plans. Seven, uh, not 17. Uh, 18, uh, require all licensed cultivation sites to be accepted, at, be inspected at least once every three years. And the 15 as well. Oh, sorry, did I skip 15? And 15, which was, um, uh, reaffirm the existing prohibition of the establishment of new cannabis uh, development on timber production zoned parcels. Is that a motion? Do you, do you want to go for that on motion? Well, I, I would like to take that as a uh, parent motion unless there's, there's uh, concern by my colleagues before we go yeah. item by item on the other ones that I think that they're going to be more in depth. I'm just trying to run, yeah, be as efficient I, as possible on this one. I would second that. Second All right, so motion. is that a, if is you that can make motion? it as a formal motion, if you could actually move. Uh, yeah, that's you, right. Um, so we have a motion from Supervisor Coonerty and a second from Supervisor uh, McPherson. Specifically just on these items, we will be going through the ones that we had a better debate on uh, point by point. So please, uh, did, Supervisor did you want McPherson. To, should we just wait for the directives and make that separate too, as I mentioned? Yeah, I think it's up to the chair. I, the way I yes. would work through it is, right. uh, yeah, we go through each one of these by items and down. then There's additional directives uh, after at that. At the end. Yeah, I've got, and I've got them written down what they are. Is there discussion on these items specifically? Okay, uh, so the mo uh, got it. Uh, we're going to vote on this after, after we're done right here. That is correct. Just this set of items right here. Um, I'm a reluctant participant. I'm going, al I'm going along. I really want to vote yes on this, okay? Uh, can we add to this uh, that that 400 feet is a yes or no? Uh, can we carve out an area? That Wait, I, I'll, I'll, uh, so yeah. Let me just explain, Supervisor Caput, the item that you're concerned about, we are going to vote on separately. So we are only voting on, so we're not dealing with setbacks, we're not dealing with cottage, we're not dealing with an odor, we're not dealing with okay. a, a number of things at this point. These were the items that seemed non-controversial from both the Planning Commission and the Board in our discussion today. And those items that you're interested in, we're taking individually. All right. And I, uh, it's, it's not anybody's fault. I always have trouble with District 2. Uh, and the, the reason I'm getting it. Don't we all. Let, let, me, <laughs> let, let, me just, let me just say the room does with me and a lot, number of my constituents do too. So this is nothing new to me. Uh, I want to clarify <laughs> one thing. Uh, what, what makes us unique Fine. here is uh, the dividing line is Green Valley Road. On his side, he has commercial ag. On my side, I have actually residential. And I, I don't see anything much about protection on residential. What is the setback residential from CA? Does anybody know that? Yeah. Yeah, well, on Green Valley Road, I have that whole Mesa Verde uh, neighborhood that's all residential. You cross into District 2 where all the trouble uh, originates. And then, <laughs> and then uh, what, what is the setback? The setbacks are not uh, specific to supervisorial districts. It's not right, residential so. ag, it's actual <laughs> residential. So, uh, so there, there's the way that, that the um, ordinance is written. We have the 200 foot <coughs> setback from cultivation area from uh, to any adjacent uh, habitable structure, regardless of okay, the Okay, and I'd like zoning. to see that extended if, if we're able to vote on that today, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Is that gonna be something we'll vote on later? It, it is, it, it's not a part of this motion, but those setbacks are a part of a discussion of another item that we will be voting on today, so okay. yes. All right, when it comes to the setbacks. Okay, and one last thing uh, before we vote on this. <laughs> uh, the good part that I do like is uh, the cost will come down. And when the cost comes down, uh, that should have a great effect on illegal growth versus legal growth. Uh, legal production, illegal production. It's kind of like, why would I buy white lightning from some still up in the mountains when I can buy a bottle of Jack Daniels at the uh, liquor store? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't do it, right? I mean, one is who knows what's going on up there and the other one's bottled, certified, and legal. So that will have a great effect. The, and the other concern that's been addressed that I do like is that uh, we do have a duty to enforce. 
And at one time, uh, I had a real hard time with that. We always have a duty to enforce the laws on the book, regardless of whether or not we agree with them. Uh, if they're the law and we haven't changed them, we have to enforce them. So that's, that's gonna help too. Uh, the last thing that's holding me back on this whole thing is, I understand people that are saying, not in my neighborhood, because you live in your neighborhood and you've protected 90% of the uh, Santa Cruz County in a lot of ways. But that other part in my area, it seems to be all or most in my neighborhood. And I have a big problem with that because I have the CA land that's affected by most of this without buffers and everything else. So I, I, I'm probably the, the one who hasn't even decided how I'm gonna vote yet because I wanna make sure it's not all or most in my neighborhood until we clarify that. So I, I don't wanna go along here and then find out later that the other part is uh, gonna be uh, uh, turned down. I want a, a bigger buffer uh, from the residential and, and from residential ag. If I can get a 400 foot buffer, then I can go along with this. Okay, well, that, that, that'll come up next. So just Chair, on these items though, we Chair, have a motion in a second. I'm sorry, could we just respond to one thing that Supervisor Caput stated so we, we wanna make sure that everybody's on the same page. The lawyers are, are concerned about the idea to state that there's a, a legal duty to enforce our code. And I know you didn't say legal duty to enforce our code. What you said is that there's a duty to enforce our code. If you meant a moral duty, I don't know whether you meant a moral duty versus a legal duty, but there is no legal duty to enforce our code. And we wanna make sure that the supervisors understand what they're voting on, and that's why staff doesn't mind this t removal of this provision because it seems like it's caused a lot of consternation in the community. What staff was trying to do was be transparent in stating that staff gets to uh, prioritize how resources are used, uh, but we don't want there to be a statement uh, left on the record or t to have people walk away um, misinformed that there is some legal duty to enforce our code because that, that is not accurate. And why would we not have any uh, legal duty? It's not, it's not a legal duty that can be enforced by a third person, in other, uh, by a third party. In other words, a third party doesn't have standing to come in and force the county to, um, uh, to, to enforce the code a certain way. I don't have an ability, for example, no. to sue the CHP and order the CHP to pull over that driver as opposed to that driver as opposed to that driver. And um, I wanna make sure that, that we're not um, miscommunicating that idea to the public and that the public doesn't believe that the removal of this provision is going to allow a neighbor to come in and sue the county for failure to enforce a certain provision as to a certain cultivator, because that's just not accurate. Does that make sense? Uh, unless that cultivator is violating the code though. I mean, what if they're, uh, they're, they're not taking care of the odor, they're not doing, uh, you know, uh, or what, for that matter, they're, they're growing illegally. Well, we have many code provisions, like for instance, an example would be an overheight fence, uh, a, six, a, a fence that's over six foot that somebody didn't come in and get a permit on. You know, somebody could sue their neighbor and, uh, and, and go to court and sue their neighbor for a failure to comply with the law, but they can't sue the county for failure to go in and enforce its code against that person. But they could call I, the county to have the sheriff go over there and, or, or uh, planning uh, code enforcement. Code enforcement could go over there and look at it and cite them? Yes, absolutely. They can cite them. Code enforcement could go over and, 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 and the cannabis licensing office, someone can call the, ca the cannabis licensing office at any point and say, sure. please, go, please go ahead, go over there and cite this person. And, w and what the cannabis licensing office does is it determines, okay, I've got a thousand complaints and I've got two people. So I've gotta be able to prioritize where I'm gonna go and when I'm gonna do it without having to run into court every 15 minutes because a neighbor or a third party comes in and says, you're not doing what I'm asking you to do. That's, that's just not the way the law is set up. 
Okay, so it basically it's the same with uh, somebody has a big party going on on Friday night, they have amplified music, and it goes past uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. Uh, it's, it's under the same type of priority? I don't know if it would be under the same type of priority, but I think you're, I think you're tracking it correctly that, that, that basically in that instance, um, if, a, if, a, if, a if, if, the, if the station, so to speak, is, is trying to deal with a, a murder, a robbery, and a burglary, and a party, they're probably gonna prioritize sure. the party as the least uh, important thing to address at that point. But they could uh, cite, uh, we, could, we could cite somebody for going beyond the, uh, the ordinance. Absolutely, that's okay. the, yeah, that's and we're going, and, 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 and staff's intention is to do that, yes, okay. to cite people. So I guess, but I, as the maker of the motion, let me just say the reason understanding that legal limitation, I think it's important that we send a message to folks that, that, that this is a whole new area of regulation that we're tr gonna hopefully have a lot of people come into the fold through uh, through our through our licensing scheme, and then the folks who don't come in, both the people who have come in as well as the overall community, has an interest in enforcement. And while there is no duty to enforce, I think us as elected officials and the sheriff's <laughs> elected officials uh, will feel an obligation to respond to community concerns as they come up, understanding that there are limited resources, but that but that we don't want to send a message out, uh, as some speakers noted today. That, that that we don't that we aren't going to enforce, uh, and so I think as a maker of the motion, that's it's important that I think we tell everyone in the community that while there is a, a lot of needs and a lot of uh, prior a lot of uh, demands on our system, that this will be a this will be a priority for us going forward. I'd like to call the question. Yeah, the questions called. Or is there anybody that? Uh, well, the question's been called. All those in favor of ending debate on this item say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so now we'll go back to the motion. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously on items one through six, 12, 13, 15, 16, and 18. Now moving back toward the other items and additional direction that we have. Supervisor Coonerty, did you want to take a shot at it? Uh, I'll take, sure, I'll take a shot, which is. Um, Starting at item seven. This, this will be just, I'm just gonna do one item. Okay. I think we should, as a, and I don't need to make these motions, but uh, as a board, the, uh, for item number seven, I would um, enhance the setback from 200 feet to 400 feet uh, as uh, my motion to, to deal with potential odors. So. We'll read this. Item seven was to revise uh, the best management practices provision regarding odor to require that any cultivator operating zone districts other than CA obtain written concurrence uh, within a thousand feet. The board is electing to uh, delete that recommendation from the planning commission based on this. There's a recommendation on the floor instead to accept the planning department's recommendation, which is to en enhance the setbacks, which are currently 200 square feet to, f not square feet, 200 feet to 400 feet of habitable structures on neighboring parcels. And if I get a second, then so I- So that's a motion on that from, and there's a second from Supervisor Caput. Um, is there discussion on this item? And I, I, I guess I'll say what I, I have real concerns. This is obviously one of the biggest neighborhood impacts we have. Um, the, what gave me some, uh, uh, what mollified some of those concerns was your discussion that as part of the annual review, uh, smell impacts could be a reason for modifying a uh, license and or revoking a license. And so I think that should create an, a, an incentive on an annual basis for people to make sure that they are not having an un, un, undue impact on their neighbors. And as a point of clarification, uh, Supervisor Caput had asked because CA and A can be adjacent, or RA can be adjacent to each other, you didn't differentiate on CA. So just to be clear, that this would include CA uh, habitable structures from CA to another, or CA to CA? From the outdoor, the, this provision, I think you're off. Uh, for outdoor grow, we okay. do not, this does not distinguish between zone districts. That's yeah. correct, is that <clears throat> your question? Okay. Yes. Okay. I have a question well, as well. Uh, would go with that if it's an indoor grow and they're they're not containing the odor, 
then uh, it, that would be something for the code enforcement to go out and look at, right? Well, th that's my question. Are we talking about only about outdoor grows here, or are we talking about outdoor and indoor grows? We would ask for clarification from your board on that. W okay, so the answer to that was outdoor based on the understanding of staff. I, I still would like additional direction that something on CA for indoor as well be addressed. I don't feel as though, and even if scrubbers aren't the answer from the majority of the board, I don't feel as though staff has enough um, uh, flexibility now to address an issue that was coming from CA property, especially now with the reduction that we just voted on from 20 acres to 10 acres to address that sense. So I, I, I don't, I don't have, I can't articulate what the language would be. This could be a direction that comes back as part of the ordinance uh, in a couple weeks, but I think that CA, uh, there should be some component that allows flexibility for staff to create mitigations for CA parcels, uh, even if we're not requiring a direct element of, say, scrubbers or a direct investment, because it may be on a site, as you had mentioned earlier, Robin, on a site-by-site -site basis. Yeah. Currently, CA is exempted from that, which is my concern. I mean, concern. we're trying to address the odor. I mean, if, if the indoor growth is causing an odor, then we got to have the same buffer for that. Under the current ordinance, proposed ordinance, CA is exempted from that. Uh, Supervisor Leopold, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the the uh, the question. Um, uh, I understand the people's interest in wanting to create a, a, a greater buffer for outdoor grows. Um, uh, and 400 feet is greater than a football field. Um, uh, it's better than 1,000 feet, which was more than three football fields. Uh, but it, 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 we have no idea whether this actually will work or not, right? I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's a pretty large buffer. I, don't, I can't think of anything else in the code where we have these kind of buffers. Again, you can, you can spray pesticides within 200 feet of someone's house. Um, and so um, it, it seems like the, um, this, is, this is more feel good than good policy and that, uh, that, uh, that I'm not going to support it um, because I think that it's not based in science or fact, it's based on feelings and emotion and that's not a good way to make policy. We've worked very hard uh, to, to, to try to win it down something that really works and th that's why I can't uh, support uh, this. I understand that. That we do have some setbacks, as you know, 600 feet or setbacks from dispensaries to other locations, like say schools, as as per the state regulations. So I don't think it's totally off off kilter with some of our other requirements within the greater cannabis uh, components that we have to have this setback. But it is true that we have nothing measurable or objective in that way. Um, if the maker of the motion would be willing uh, to at least have as additional direction that staff come back uh, with something in regards to CA that would give them the flexibility. So I'm not trying to open up this ordinance in a way that's concerning, but I just want them to have the flexibility when there's the, the licenses come up after a year that they actually can m put in requirements that would address odor mitigations on CA properties. That's a friendly, yeah, that's friendly. Yeah, uh, and just to be clear, we're still t only talking about outdoor and your concern about CA is that even indoor. That is correct. Because on all the other zone parcels, they're required to have the scrubbers and everything that is, else. That is and, correct. And that's an enforceable That's piece. correct. And I'm not saying that there needs to be a scrubber. I recognize that in the February meeting there wasn't three votes for that support, but on a site-by-site -site basis, I would like to see the, some flexibility after a year if there's an issue. That's what I'm bringing up. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is there any additional discussion on this uh, side? Uh, only that I, I think it should include indoor grow and uh, outdoor grow. Uh, the odor is the problem. And again, uh, if it's only, if the indoor grow doesn't have to do it, then I think, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, so right now the proposal is uh, outdoor grow only. With additional direction that, additional that, dir that staff come back uh, on April 24th? 24th. April 24th in regards to CA inc that includes indoor uh, that would provide flexibility for odor mitigation for them, especially in the license renewal component. What's the planning department's uh, recommendation today? Indoor and outdoor or just outdoor? The planning commission's recommendation just focused on outdoor and therefore the planning staff's recommendation, uh, well not recommendation, but options only included outdoor. And then you're going to look at it and come back on the 24th with the recommendation. So <laughs> 
I'm, I'm trusting you to come back on a recommendation for outdoor grow, but I don't know if it's coming or not. It's coming on outdoor, so that the, the motion today is to increase the setbacks for outdoor cultivation for all zone districts from 200 to 400 feet. That's an increase in setbacks Increasing for all zone. From all 200 zone. Yes. to 400. On CA specifically, in February, actually an item that you had voted for, in, did not require scrubbers on indoor <coughs> greenhouse grows or structure grows within uh, CA. So uh, I've asked staff on a friendly amendment that my colleagues accepted to come back with language that would give them flexibility around odor mitigation on indoor grows within CA as well. Okay, and I would appreciate if you do come up with a no on the recommendation that you put it in writing that you're recommending no on uh, restrictions on the odor of within 400 feet on indoor grow. I, rather than just a verbal, we're not going to put it in. I, I want to see it actually. If you put yes, I'm going to be in favor of it. But if you if you don't have a recommendation for it, I want it to be addressed in writing. Okay. So we have a motion and a second with an amendment. Well, so th there, there's just been a lot of discussion and back and forth, and staff is not clear on what this actual motion is. Sure. So if, so if the, you could state it, state sure. it in one in sure. one. Sure. The sense. motion is. Um, Increase setbacks from outdoor cultivation to habitable structures on neighboring, neighboring parcels from the current 200 feet to 400 feet with additional direction to come back to give with. Uh, to give flexibility to, to the, the cannabis licensing officer for odor mitigation on CA land, including indoor. <laughs> Clear as mud. Mm -hmm. It's a tough item. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions from our bank of attorneys? <laughs> None? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. It passes 4-1 uh, with Supervisor Leopold uh, voting no. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty, if you want to try for item 8. Um. I guess I don't. I don't have as much of a. Uh, <coughs> I don't have as much of an opinion well, on this. Uh, Supervisor, well, I, I, would, I, I would say Supervisor McPherson had proposed uh, that uh, we allow um, uh, class two extraction processes, those that don't involve CO2, and, and you can correct me, Supervisor McPherson, if I'm wrong, on RA zone parcels, and that they could include. Uh, all uh, uh, parts of this, uh, the class two extraction process uh, on property of a certain size. And I don't know whether you had an idea there, uh, Supervisor McPherson. No, I didn't. Um, I, I, yeah. So item eight, so that the, the community knows of the Planning Commission's recommendation was to remo remove eligibility for class two manufacturing operations in the RA zone district. The two options presented by counting staff was to allow a, a limited subset of class two extraction processes such as activities that don't involve ethanol or CO2 extraction on RA zone and to allow class two extraction on larger RA zone properties or with increased setback to neighboring properties. Um, the discussion at the board is to accept these options but to further define them right now. So uh, it looks like uh, option A is not an issue. Option B, we just need to define what a larger uh, property would be defined as. Yeah, I mean, my, my sense about the class two um, manufacturing operations is that these are really non-volatile um, uh, extraction processes. And so uh, uh, I understand uh, the concerns, but I think if we say on RA parcels uh, larger than five acres, um, that we would, uh, that that would work out well. I think that that's acceptable, yeah, I'd, I'd be fine. Is there additional discussion? We actually have a, do you want to make that as a motion, Supervisor? I'll, I'll make Leopold? it as a motion to allow uh, uh, the class two extraction on RA zone parcels that uh, um, uh, less than five acres that don't include any ethanol CO2 extraction and over five acres all class two manufacturing process. Second, I'll second that. Is there discussion on this item? Additional discussion? Okay, I have concerns about this item, so I'll just be voting no, but I appreciate the work that uh, people have put into this. So all those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, item nine uh, is to, the, under the Planning Commission's recommendation, is to prohibit the joining of parcels to reach the minimum parcel size on RA zone parcels or SU zone parcels with uh, mountain residential or rural residential general plan designations. I, I guess Supervisor I, McPherson was in favor of this item uh, when you brought it forward, so um, I don't know if there's anybody that actually wants to uh, debate that element. I thought it was made clear from Supervisor Leopold's questioning that this actually did not eliminate the 40% component, uh, which is what the Planning Commission was aiming to do, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to move this recommended action. I didn't know if there was, uh, if there was disagreement on the board about this, but I'll move that recommendation. Second. Yeah. Okay. My, my sense about the SU parcels is that I like that we found something that can allow people who've been operating to stay in place and uh, it, as part of a longer term planning effort to think about where it would be more appropriate. And I think that that's a, that's a good balance. I found that uh, to be very useful for uh, what the Planning Commission did. Okay, well then we have a motion and a second to accept the Planning Commission's recommendation, which is to prohibit the joining of parcels to reach the minimum parcel size on RA zone parcels or SU zone parcels with mountain residential or rural residential general plan designations. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, so now item 10 was to add a new cottage garden license category subject to the following, a minimum parcel size of two and a half acres, maximum canopy of 500 square feet, limited to ARA, TP, and SU zone districts, continuous cultivation by the applicant since before January of 2013, registration by cultivator with the county in 2016, absence of complaints filed against the property within five years of applications, the applicant must reside on the property, all back cannabis business taxes must be paid in full, co-location, and our master plans are prohibited, a level five permit processing, and the license is non-transferable. Um, this is where we, where this is where we. Uh, this is item number 10. Yeah, number 10, the. the uh, With a uh, staff recommendation. Yeah, the staff recommendation. Um, but I think, uh, well, the proposal I would like to see is a level four permit processing. The I, I think that's. I would support that. So the option from uh, proposed by staff is to reduce the cottage garden land use permit process to level four, which maintains the public noticing requirement without the added time and expense of a public hearing. There's a motion from Supervisor McPherson to create this uh, new cottage garden licensing component with a second from Supervisor Leopold with a modification that would reduce the permit process to level four as their discussion on this item. I express my concern uh, with this. I think that the board should make a commitment then to look at other home occupations. I think it's odd that we well, you know, well, I, uh, just in, to that point, you know, when someone goes to get a home occupation permit, they get it, it, it doesn't come back every year, right? I mean, th this, w these licenses are very different than home occupation. I understand your point, but if there's a problem, it's gonna come back uh, be, uh, 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 for licensure the following year. We don't do that for home occupations. Is there, is, is there other discussion on this item with that one modification? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Whoa. Moving on to item 11. <laughs> item 11 was to make the RA zone parcels ineligible for relocation. So I would make, uh, I would move uh, the recommended action, make RA zones parcels ineligible for relocation, but you, and use the uh, January 2013 date. Uh, as, as the <coughs> benchmark. So to prohibit relocation to RA zone parcels unless the parcels have been under cannabis cultivation since prior to January 20 of 13, that's what you mean on the motion? Is so there a second? There's a second. Is there discussion uh, to I would the just 2013 say, date? I understand the point. I think that uh, RA zone parcels of a certain size should, we, we should include here. Um, uh, if we look at it at 10 acres or more, there, um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a much shorter list, uh, and we could find uh, some balance of making sure that, uh, um, that this works. So I wouldn't, uh, I'm not gonna support the uh, motion. Uh, uh, okay, I explain that. I, I actually, you've got a good point there. I, uh, what is the parcel size that we're voting on? Well, so, this, this would say all residential ag parcels 
would not be eligible for relocation. So if I'm on a parcel and I wanna move, uh, I'm gonna be grandfathered in because I've had good practices of whatever my zone parcel is. Now I wanna move to a place that, with this RA zone parcel. I would not be able to do it under this motion. Okay, anyway, I'm ready to vote. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm supportive of the motion. I have concerns, as was raised by some in the, in the community, about uh, people trying to move on to these parcels that weren't already engaged in this activity. I think the 2013 date is consistent with TPZ. I think it should be something we harmonize throughout the code and we'll have an opportunity to another item. So we have a motion to make RA zone parcels ineligible for relocation and to prohibit the relocation of RA zone parcels unless the parcels have been under cannabis cultivation since prior to January 2013. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So we have a motion passes 4 1 to Supervisor Leopold dissenting on that item. Uh, item number 14 to allow non retail commercial cannabis cultivation eligibility for parcel zone special use with mountain residential, rural residential, or agricultural general plan designations subject to the following restrictions. Sites with existing cannabis cultivation shall be subjected to a 10 acre minimum. Sites where new cultivation is proposed shall be subject to a 20 acre minimum parcel size. Um, staff had made an option on the January 2013 versus November 2016 uh, component. Supervisor uh, Coonerty, oh sorry, sir, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, I'd be happy to advance this with the with the 2013 date. I think it, it, it makes some sense. Second. So we have a motion and a second, just to read it again. This would allow non-retail commercial cannabis cultivation eligibility for parcel zone SU with mountain residential, rural residential, or agricultural general plan designations subject to these restrictions. The sites with existing cannabis cultivation have a 10 acre minimum. Sites with new ha should have a 20 acre minimum parcel size. However, in order to qualify as an existing cultivation site, evidence must be provided that the site has been under cannabis cultivation since before January of 2013. That's the motion that's on the table. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, item number 17 is to provide a 24-hour comment and or message line within the cannabis licensing office. Um, Go ahead, it, Supervisor we, McPherson. We need to word this differently. I mean, we're not going to have somebody at 24-7, so. Um, uh, Robin, what are you doing I, at night? <laughs> should, what should, I mean, should we say, uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know if it's necessary. I think we want to let them know that they can call in with a, if people have a problem, but I, I don't know, beyond that, you know, just simplify it. We can have them ring your house. <laughs> so so curr we do currently have a form on the website. I think that, I don't know if you need additional direction to add it onto Citizens Connect. I think it makes a lot of sense to have the mobile app. And will there be a phone number that people can also call just like they would with code compliance? Then I, I don't know that we actually need um, to accept this item. So I think that the board just is in agreement that we won't actually accept that recommendation from the Planning Commission. I don't believe we need action to not accept an item, correct? Okay. Correct. Item number, is that it? I think that's the Okay, well then we do have actual recommended actions that were put forward by staff to actually uh, schedule the public hearing, direct the, board, the clerk of the board, et cetera. So items one through four of the recommended actions were to consider recommendations from the Planning Commission regarding proposed amendments to the code chapter 7.128, 13.10, and 16.01, rel related amendments to the general plan local coastal program for cannabis licensing and land use regulations for non-retail commercial cannabis cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, to direct staff to prepare the final draft proposed amendments to the county code and general plan local coastal plan and related documents including CEQA findings, to schedule a public hearing for April 24, 2018 at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider adoption and concept of the proposed amendments to the county code and general plan local coastal program consideration of CEQA findings and direct the clerk of the board to publish notice of the public hearing at least 10 days prior to the hearing date. I know we have additional direction on other things, but do we have a motion for these items? I will move that. Second. Those are recommended action. And a second. So we have a motion and a second on these. We will have additional directions that we'll be providing. Um, we could do those as a separate motion or as additional direction on this motion. I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Supervisor Coonerty. Uh, provisional authorization, compassionate use, 
and report backs either quarterly or semi semi annually were something that had been presented well, by supervisor. That, and I was also interested in, in some of the other commercially zoned property to have a lower level of oh, that's uh, right. uh, review. So is there would we consider it a friendly amendment to uh, direct the chair of the board to write a letter encouraging uh, on the compassionate use program? That is a state friendly law amendment. change. Okay. Uh, just Supervisor McPherson was allowing flexibility on quarterly versus semi-annually. Just an honest statement, what would be, can you do either or which one would be preferred? We can do quarterly. Okay. So a friendly amendment to have quarterly report backs, which is something I know the community had asked for for a transparency perspective. Uh, the provisional authorization. <coughs> it's understood what that is. Just making sure we got it. It is. Okay. Friendly amendment. And on the M1 C and C4, was there another one? Yeah, C2. C2 parcel uh, to have those uh, similar to the CA definition. Yeah. A, 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 a level. level four. Review. And, and also flexibility or discretion to the, uh, uh, the cannabis licensing officer uh, about setbacks. Are there questions on that? Is, there, is that clear from staff? I want to make sure before we leave you on this that you actually. I'm oh, sorry. Please, no, please. The, the setbacks with respect to non conforming. Yeah. Specifically. Yeah, the residential structures. Yep. Are there any concerns or questions on this? Is to move the recommended actions with additional direction. We have a motion in a second. It includes the provisional authorization, the compassionate use letter, uh, quarterly reports, and uh, a couple of different zones in the manufacturing and commercial uh, to align them a little bit more with CA. Uh, and um, are there any other questions or concerns with that? No, that was a friendly amendment. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. <laughs> Believe it or not, I don't want to adjourn anything and make sure I'm right. Um, I believe that that is actually the entire thing that was before us today. Is that correct? Okay. So we will see 99.9% uh, .9 of you on April 24th. Uh, and I appreciate all of your time coming forward and participating in the process.